What's good, my people? Marvel demystifiers assemble. <laughs> oh, man. How you guys doing? I know Gabriel's been ready to empty this cup for a while, and Gabriel's got a new cup with owls on it, so I think we're all set. Oh, yeah. Gordy to who shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, everybody, we're going to be getting into Moon Knight Episode 3 the ambitious attempt that we are going to for sure succeed at, which is to do all six episodes of Moon Knight. I remember when I thought we could do like two or three <laughs> in one shot <laughs> in one episode, but there seems to be quite a lot to decode. Um, some of it very obvious, some of it not so obvious. Really looking forward to see what you guys have come up with in this. I've got plenty of slides to go at and uh, good notes. And this time, I think the big themes or the biggest theme for me is the legal system themes that are below the surface. There's a court proceeding. There's uh, passports. There, there's a lot to do with that. So, you know, your straw man identity versus your real identity, the public and the private. I think that's a major theme in the show at large, but this episode hones in on it. And on top of that, we get plenty of misconstrued Egyptological fake history, fake news. Those are the two big things that I want to point out as we go through. How about you guys? Any major themes to uh, warm us up with before we get into the breakdown or anything you want to say? Um, I'm anxious to see what uh, Gabriel's cooking up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot of themes that I, I kept seeing... Um, Royal royalty, like kind of chosen oneness kind of uh, things in here. Um, the cult uh, aspect kept coming back up. Um, cults being the, uh, I don't know, the scapegoat maybe? I don't know. But uh, I found a, a fun little Easter egg too that we'll get into. Oh, I yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I caught that one, too, although not through my comic scholarliness, through side research into it, you know, seeing what other people said were Easter eggs, which there's a lot there. But I th you know what would be fun? Gabriel, first of all, you kick us off with anything that you want to unleash, and then uh, I'll do my thing. Yeah, man. So I'm totally on board with that. You know, the legal system is is the... The foundational theme. I think that's what we're kind of getting is a a glimpse at the roots of law. You know, uh, everybody knows should know that law is biblical. It's based on you know the way that the law worked in the Bible, and that story is based on on Egyptological law going all the way back. So we will see a lot of that continuity of uh, how the legal system works. And one thing that I'm uh, with that in mind as my lens, I'm beginning to see how uh, apparently not only does our legal systems and the machinations of government adhere to uh, those old ways, but also uh, there is a very fascinating parallel to secret societies and certain uh, Ordo Templi Orientis Crowleyan 
concepts. You know, we talked on that last time that that, you know, that his in his street informant, the street performer, his name was Crowley, you know, and he's a statue, uh, a statue performer who's, uh, you know, uh, appears to be gilded in gold. And there's that guild. Uh, very interesting that he's a gilt, gold gilded Crowley. Um, so that came up in the last one. So what I'm getting at is I do believe that our government is also reflecting uh, certain behavioral patterns, signs and symbols that they are adhering to some of these uh, uh, schools of the secret keepers, shall we say. And you just shot this over to me. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's go right at it. Is this inspired from our conversation on Weaving Spiders Webs last night where we talked a lot about sodomy <laughs> for whatever reason? It is very profound that that came up last night just before, just before we did the show today. This I, uh, I came up with about a week or a little over a week ago. I was just looking at the logo for Marvel Studios and... Uh, very quickly, I saw that LSTU is a uh, anagram for lust. And so then I look at it a little closer and I see that uh, L-E-V-R-A is basically Libra in reverse. And those are the two cards that Aleister Crowley fucked with two of the cards. He fucked with all a lot of the cards, but these are the two he switched. He literally took the Libra and put it up in the position of August, the eighth position, and dropped uh, Lust down into the Libra or Justice cards position. So he switched Justice and Libra as his signature, his uh, his mark on the, Th the Thoth Crowley deck. is a uh, This is like a hallmark of his touch. And the remaining letters... Once you've taken the lust in the Libra out of Marvel Studios, the remaining letters give you almost Sodom. Mm. Close enough for me. The way that your mind picks up these patterns is <laughs> incredible, man. Know, incredible dude. because you're you're right on with the Li Libra is a huge theme in this show, obviously. The bad guys all have the scales tattoo. It's the first thing you see in the actual like opening scene of episode one. And L E V R A very much encodes Libra because because it's very common between languages for the V to become a B. V to That's B right. is a, a very just like L to R type switch. Mm -hmm. So Libra, Levra, <laughs> Lust, yeah. and Sodom, and then you know other words that I see in there are Ma or Mar, obvious reasons, and Dios. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, one thing I think that, I mean, there are many schools of thought on what he was getting at with this. But one thing I would point out is that uh, Libra also refers to the lips, the labia, the lips. And he brought the lips to the lion. And that hails back to the Knights Templar kissing the cat ass, uh, which just cracks me up. Like, uh, you know. I think there's a bit of a, a joke, a nod, a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to those who know about lips and cat asses in the Knights Templar in 1312, I think, was when that happened. Uh, right there in where Notre Dame, where Notre, under Notre Dame Cathedral is where they were kissing that cat ass. And outside of Notre Dame Cathedral is where they burned Jacques Bollet. And, oh. and one more, I mean, I'll just throw this out because it occurred to me a while back. Uh Bill Cooper, as a child, was in the secret society Cub Scouts, known as the uh, the Moulet Society. Oh, so man. he's a member of the Jacques Moulet Society. And he wrote the book, Beware a Pale Horse. Moulet, Jacques Moulet, got emoliated for kissing cat ass and worshiping Bath Fomet. B-A-P-H, Beware a Pale Horse. Bath, the initials of Cooper's book are an acronym for Bath. And he went to Molay Cub Scouts, essentially. So I think that is very telling 
that we have uh, Bill Cooper uh, signaling some BAPH, something to think about. Well, speaking of Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, I think I'm going to play the audio from this one minute clip. Um, world builders feature it. I think I can get away with playing the audio from this, probably not the video, but you know, we're early enough into the stream that if this screws us over, <laughs> I'll just restart the stream, but I have a feeling this will work out. I just want everyone to hear how like these actors and producers of this show are patting themselves on the back and telling you, oh yeah, we're giving you the most accurate information about ancient Egypt and their traditions and their beliefs and it's complete BS. And I want to constantly bring our attention back to how one of the important things that is being attempted by a series like this is to give a new generation and older generations a revamped understanding or a first impression, more importantly, understanding of ancient Egypt and what these people believed, which can completely throw somebody off the course of what may actually be valuable from these traditions and what is valuable from these traditions is <laughs> I think mostly still lost. So we're going to get into that historical aspect a lot while we're in the show. So here, I'm going to try to play this audio. If it's not loud enough, you guys tell me if you guys can hear it well enough, then everybody should be able to. So I'm going to give it a go. With Moon Knight, we're in a very different world. The world building is so complete and interesting. And it's hard to paint such a big canvas. While you watch the show, you will learn about ancient Egypt. What was challenging is to do something that has a historical feeling, to stay in the world of ancient Egypt. We get to see these inner sanctums of ancient temples. All the names and roles of the gods, it has so much historical accuracy. We did research on how a tomb would look, how a sarcophagus would look. Every single thing was so authentic. That's resonant through the entire series. As an actor, it really keeps you in the world. Amazing thought has gone into creating this show, and I think it infuses everybody with wanting to bring their best. Amazing thought, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love how he sounds like he's trying to convince himself. Like it has this air of authenticity. <laughs> well, the soundtrack behind him, like dun, 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 dun. that really helps. Yeah. We're serious. You should hear us. We're telling you the truth, even though it's bullshit. Trust the big D. Trust the big dick. Big dick. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time in it, but I am going to give a brief recap for anybody that's some like needing a bit of a refresher of where we came from in the first two episodes. Uh, Stephen Grant has disassociative identity disorder. He moonlights as a, I guess, superhero called Moon Knight. <laughs> and his alter ego or his main ego, we don't know yet, is Mark Spector. Yeah, a mercenary. Um, so he's possessed by the Egyptian god of the moon, Khonsu, who they call Khonshu, which is important an important difference in the name. Uh, he runs around trying to stop the bad guys from getting this scarab thing while he's also losing his mind. The scarab is to lead the bad guy Harrow to the tomb of Amit, who is the crocodile-headed god that consumes and devours the souls of uh, the dead who do not have their, their heart weigh in balance on the scales of Maat. And... Where we left off, the hero, if you can call him that, has to go to Cairo, Egypt, which in itself is a name that I think is like the same exact deal that they do with uh, <laughs> with shows like this, where they put names out there of things that have a specific meaning, but then they make they make something famous have that name so that when everyone hears that word, they're thinking of that thing like Cairo is actually the Cairo that we were talking about last night, the symbol or monogram of, of the Christos, the first two letters in Greek of, of Christ and, or of Jesus. And anyway, it's just like the way that they infuse these uh, video games and TV shows with the scavenged mythology so that when somebody goes to do some research on it, the entire first 20 pages of search results is going to be about, you know, fake fiction stuff. Although... <laughs> 
that could be what the, uh, the, the mythology itself is fiction too. So there's a point to be made there, but anyway, they, they left for Egypt and that's where we're picking up. Is anything else important to put in there? Uh, I was thinking about the fact the first two were in London and the third one is in Cairo and that's an LLC, which is just weird. Just a strange random thought. Uh, uh, in the last one, they were being they were one of the deciding moments when he summoned the suit for the first time. Uh, uh, Kanchu is yelling at him, summon the suit, summon the suit. And that's his apotheosis moment. And he, you know, sticks the landing and he's all dressed in a uh, London gentleman's gear. Uh, and that seemed to me like they were maybe suggesting that we summon a class action lawsuit. Just an interesting thought that, you know, if, uh, if you're looking for remedy, you're going to have to do it uh, by the book, by the law. You're going to have to fulfill the book. Uh, strange how prophetic that might come out, turn out to be in real life. Just a thought. Oh, boy. I don't, I, you know, this one, uh, can we get into where it starts? Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just do that where, because it goes, it starts off where she's in the, she's getting a new passport. So she's in here. Um, you could tell that she's, okay, she's being initiated. She's going into the field. And so she's getting her equipment, right? From, I guess it would be like a kind of a, a Q kind of character. I'm not sure who she is other than she used to work for her dad and her dad was so this woman called her dad uh, he was a archaeologist but it she called him a bunch of uh book obsessed or or something obsessed bookworms and and i was thinking about like if you know some like archaeologists if you ever had like college archaeology buddies yeah those are the nerds that probably didn't get in the field and uh, so they knew everything, but they very rarely actually dug anything up. You know, they knew it all just kind of intellectually, but not practically. And that's kind of what she's alluding to it, as she kind of says this. Now, as she's doing this, she pulls out a, uh, a container of uh, little white treats and those are marshmallows. This is right. There it is. Ah, yeah, there you go. So she, and I noticed that she doesn't eat one, but she gives it to her to eat. Now in, so this made me go down the, the marshmallow hole. And so in ancient, I didn't even know the history of, of uh, marshmallow until I was like, why the hell is she feeding her a marshmallow? So the deal is that a marshmallow actually comes from um, ancient Egypt. There was a marshmallow. It was a medicine, but it was also a treat. Um, so marshmallow comes from the, this root, it's a Althea collect. Uh, anyway, it's a, it, I can't remember the, the Latin name. I've got it right here. It is Athea officinalis. Right. It's official health. That's it. So wow. Althea is, is health, is an original health. It sounds right? a lot like a way of saying public health, which is a magic phrase that grants powers and rights to governments that they otherwise don't have. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> well, as soon as you said official... Ophi, Ophi, it's the Ophi official health. This is that's why they circumcise babies. That's why they take the Ophi off of the baby is for health. And she just nips, she nips the tip. She's biting the tip off. This is a bris ritual. <laughs> now hold on here. It's not the only bris ritual in code. Like the, the next scene shows you the next part of it, but we'll get there. 
Oh my gosh. Official. I'm so health. glad you picked up on that. I was like, you... <laughs> okay. Let... Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Damn. Okay. So, okay. Let me get back to, to the, what I think they're hinting at and why she is given the marshmallow. Marshmallows in ancient times, um, from what uh, limited information I could find, was apparently a um, big deal for the royals. It was it was uh, saved merely for the for nobles and royal blood, or god gods and royals. That's what it, that was the term that was used: gods and royals. Um, because it's also it's a it's like a treat and they kind of treat it in the thing I was reading, which was apparently taken from some ancient recipe um, was that they, so they would do it in the way they make marshmallows. There's a, there's a, a gelatinous kind of goo that you get from the, from the leaves and the roots of a marshmallow plant, but it's got all these crazy health properties, right. That have been completely lost um, like I was talking about with Michelle about the, uh, the yeah, marshmallow. Th this marshmallow know? she's eating does not contain any of the actual plant that we get the word marshmallow from. No, this is an inversion of the actual what they would do. I mean, this is st strictly symbolic. I mean, essentially it'd be like a, a cracker and, and a sip of wine or something, but it's kind of community yeah. with this thing. Yes. And because, uh, I mean, there's the whole... You know, rituals are often done with a food, right? Especially in film. Whenever there's food and eating in film, there's always deeper subtext there. Mm -hmm. yes. They told me that in film studies class. Wow. Yeah, so uh, they would... Uh, but the original original mushroom or marshmallow had like nuts and dates and stuff. And apparently they're pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Um I will, I should grow some and do it sometime. But uh, now I'm like thinking I need to grow a marshmallow. Um, but uh, this she's, I think they're telling you, you she's chosen. She's yeah, from she, Royal birth. And yeah. so you gotta, I mean, this is foreshadowing there. She's initiating her. So. Yeah. And so marsh, that plant grows in the marsh. That's why it's called the marshmallow. And we history will prove out that the banking cartels love to set up shop in the marsh. They love Venice. They love uh, Washington, D.C., um, even Amsterdam and Denmark. They would set up in the marshes. They really love the swamps. And that is totally what this is culturally hailing back to in a major way. That's a brilliant find. That's a brilliant find. Yeah, really good. Um, and we'll back up onto a couple other elements of this. The passport is really important. Gabriel, you sent me a few things, so just tell me if you want me to pull right. up any of your stuff. Let's let's start on the most the most recent one I sent you. Okay, I'll I'll pull that up after I go over a couple of details. That, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is the second time we're shown a foraged passport, but. Interestingly, the passport is actually her real identity. This is actually her name. Just like with Mark, whenever Stephen finds the passport for Mark Spector, that's actually his real um, name. He, he's really Mark Spector. Anyway, Layla's a Scorpio. This is important. 1028. So we got Scorpio and Pisces are the two main characters. And they're going up against Libra. <laughs> the fact that Libra and... Uh, Scorpio used to be part of the same constellation of the sky clock is also very important. When we think about the symbolism of that, Aquila, the hawk or the eagle, which is very much uh, related to major gods of ancient Egypt who are depicted that way, in particular Horus. So the passport represents your, you know, pri your uh, private self or your state identity as opposed to your fictional corporate personhood identity on the driver's license so the fact that they these characters are using passports as their identification i think demonstrates too back to that idea of that she's like chosen or initiated or royal in some way that she's got freedom uh she's not 
in the serf class or the slave class. Uh, interesting too, is that in there's a line of dialogue in this where if you can see on her passport, it says she's an antiquities dealer. And the Q lady ribs her a little bit and is like, uh, are, <laughs> is that really accurate? You're stealing these. And she says, I only steal from people that stole it first. Or she says, I don't steal. They've already been stolen. So this is also encoding that she's a salvager, which takes us to the back to the Ophi of it all. <laughs> Uh, because that, that root salve is related to serpent. And it is also, of course, salvation, Messiah in code. And uh, she definitely fulfills a role like that in the, mm -hmm. in the show later on. And the salvagers are the pirates or the ones with fire. Pirate coming from the same root as pyramid. So she's, um, you know, she's stealing from thieves, but she's still pirating things. So I think that's really important symbolism. Um, and the, I don't know if you already said this. I had to get up for a second and go make sure my dog was all right because he started barking about something, but he's fine. <laughs> so they, he calls her his little scarab, which is also a symbol of, um, you know, a solar deity in code, just like the Aquila. I mean, I'll just get right out and say it. Later in this series, she's got wings. <laughs> she's definitely encoding this other higher octave of Scorpio later on. Uh, in this episode, she's the the death aspect of Scorpio. She's killing people, you know. Um, so the scarab is an important symbol throughout the whole show. I won't linger on that, but a very important theme. We we call this Moon Knight Ultra, right? The MK Ultra of it. This episode starts to really dig deeper into that side of trauma based programming. And the passport forger lady is talking about her dead father. And obvious that Layla is not over it yet. And the, the forger lady says, it's easy to get stuck. Fixate on what's hurt us. Fixate on what's hurt us is being said while she's biting the tip, just the tip, the oh, bris ritual. She says. That's yeah. Right. And, and she stamps the passport as she mm -hmm. says that. She's imprinting mm -hmm. the trauma onto the passport as she says that those words. There you go. And uh, she says, I miss him too, but that's your baggage. She says, that's your baggage. <laughs> oh, the marshmallow is the mimetic device. It's placenta. It's the placenta. They're laminating. They're laminating the passport. It's, we're in the liminal space. We're in the in-between where she's about to go on her adventure. And then she kisses the lady, which is initiation, a beso, his first base. <laughs> and then goes off on her adventure, kisses our initiation for oh, and Scorpio. She's Scorpio, so there's a kiss as well. It's it's required. Oh, for you, kiss. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good stuff. So, you want me to go to this high priestess? Yeah, send the most or put up the most recent one. Oh, okay. I I went crazy one night, guys. Uh, I I know I you went, do. Yeah, I went crazy <laughs> in. I, I was telling the guys that night, I was like, the penetration is deep. The penetration is so deep. <laughs> and, I said uh, our, our, uh, our catchphrase from now on should be marvelous to mystifiers, deep penetration. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't think I can get to all of the layers of what I was able to garner just from the introduction scene. I'm probably going to miss a lot of points, but I tried to bring them all forward in these graphics. Um, so I, I absolutely believe that we are seeing, in the beginning, we're seeing um, the High Priestess card, which is not in Scorpio interesting enough. Uh, High Priestess card is in Capricorn, to be very technical. But I looked up some interesting events that took place on her birthday. And... Uh, a lot of interesting facts came forward. October 28th is the 301st day of the Gregorian calendar. 31 is a Belphegor's prime that triggers me right away, makes me think of uh, this particular uh, number. It's very uh, enigmatic, and it's everywhere I see. I look nowadays whenever I see 31 or 13. Uh, on this day, Elvis Presley received a polio vaccination on national television. Very interesting. The king was vaxxed on this day. Italian fascists led by Bonito Mussolini marched on Rome and took over the Italian government. 
very, very interesting. And then the U.S. President Grover Cleveland dedicated the Statue of Liberty. And we all know that that's a fucking eunuch call sign. That's the Sol Invictus, S-O-L. Statue of Liberty is Sol Invictus. And that's not a lady. That is not a lady up there. <laughs> and then uh, some other things about her birthday and the, uh, the issuing date. Uh, her birthday is a, because we're in Europe, they put the, the day of the month first and the month second. So uh, that's something that's important to know. So the two and the eight becomes 10 and reduces to a one on her birth, the, the day of her birth. The issue date is a two plus nine that go, turns into an 11, reduces to a two. So we got a one and a two. That's a Joaquin J and a Boaz two. So her these first led these first numbers on her birth date and the issue date are a J to the B, a Joachim and a Boaz. And also, Gordy, you, you were pointing at that marshmallow container. Let's see. Yeah. God, there's so much in here. So we're on episode three, which uh, the Joachim plus the Boaz gives you the three, the Gemmel. And if you look at the Crowley uh, High Priestess card, you'll see the camel down here below representing the three, the Gemmel. Now, some of her first words, she says, he was not 20 minutes away from our house in her first sentence. The next sentence, she says, it's been 10 years since I was in Egypt. Well, there's a two and a 10, a two and a one, a Boaz and a Jockey. And also, I noticed that she's got the, the color he blue. The color of he blue seems to be a very important uh, uh, code for this entire scene because the matriarch, the lady who's making this passport, she has a cap. Her pin is, uh, has a very blue, a brilliant blue lid to the pin, and she's using a mouse. So she is the authority of uh, authorizing this uh, passport for her. And then the cap of the marshmallows was the same exact color blue. And so that really stood out to me in a major way. Uh, and it kind of, it tells us that we're dealing with royalty. You know, they're basically dressing them up in those royal colors. So, uh, so what this means to me in a, in a um, way deeply occulted fashion is this is uh, giving homage to the mantle of high priest uh, or high priestess. And that mantle has real world implications. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they get into tarot and it's all good in terms of the personal work and the personal relationship to it. That is how this is supposed to work. But I'm here to tell you when you get out and you do it, uh, when you apply this system to the public at large, it has a whole nother dynamic and takes on some very nefarious uh, tones and implications that people don't think about. Uh, and those are two really important things, like your personal relationship to the tarot, that's all good. That's a whole nother thing. But what I'm about to point out is that it has been used uh, in mass in a pretty uh, underappreciated fashion. Uh, Chance, can you go to the next? Let me just verify that just yeah. because you and I, when we first started working together, it was around the time that you did that huge project of correlating the first 22 Marvel movies to the 22 major arcana all right. leading up to the end game where half the population is snapped out of existence. And what did that lead us into in the real world right after that sudden adult drop in syndrome <laughs> yep. and worried about like, I actually just got a, I shouldn't say worried, but you know, I do want to be a little coded for YouTube when we can about certain terms because they did just pull my serpents and the dirt deep church, the derp church episode with David Whitehead. Uh, YouTube did so, you know, really? yeah, yeah, they they mm. deleted. Yep. yep. So Too we're totally, to the yep, we're totally over the target. Yeah. Well, so in that in that work that you and I did, Chance, I brought up the fact that um, I. My aunt, she told me that the tarot is uh, is a personal relationship. It's a one-on-one, -on -one, private kind of thing. 
And I totally agree with her. That is how it's supposed to be. But I'm also beginning to see that it's been put, it's been misappropriated in a very uh, fascinating way that I think should, maybe we should bring to light. Uh, so the High Priestess card, I've been meditating on it very deeply uh, with this project in particular, and taking it to new, whole new levels that I never thought of before. So in my Tarot Tories work, the, uh, the High Priestess is the Mississippi River. It represents the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is the placenta of the nation. It is the, uh, the umbilicus. It is the uh, port of call for uh, all of the bounty uh, so that uh, goods and services in the olden days, goods and services use that as the main line of transportation. So it's a very important mantle. And whoever is presuming to be the high priestess of America is, uh, uh, is probably at the highest level of influence. Uh, and I mean influence in the most uh, river-esque uh, context possible. So I've come to believe that both uh, uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden are wearing the mantle of high priestess. And it may not make a lot of sense at first. That might sound pr completely freaking preposterous, but let's take a minute and try to substantiate yeah. the possibility of this. And it is really deep. It goes really deep. We're talking penetration of the highest order here. Uh, so so uh, if you bring up that next one, Chance, uh, the one with with uh, Joachim and Boaz falling on the ground. So Joe Biden's name is a J and a B. You know, that's the high priest. Or just Joe saying. and Barack, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So he's a J. A Joe Biden is a J and a B. It's part of his mantle, if his name. And his kids' names were Bo and Hunter. But Hunter is a Jaeger in Norse. I think that's Norse is Jaeger. So Jaeger is a J. Bo is a B. His kids' names were J and B. And so, uh, if you uh, so chance brought forward this really interesting uh, Egyptian flag on the weaving spiders, and he, I think you. Oh, uh, this isn't Egyptian here, but the idea of the vexiloid that okay. took us there uh, started for me looking at the flags that may have been on the pylons at the ancient Egyptian temples, and they weren't exactly flags as we understand them, but. Okay. I was led there thinking about flagellation and that whole opening scene and the fact that the main bad guy, Harrow, is walking around with the glass, broken glass right. in his shoes and his right. gaiters. So, so this isn't Egyptian per se, but we okay. got there through the word vexiloid, which okay. is the name for this type of uh, this symbol that we're seeing here. Right. So uh, you dropped that on us in the in the weave that night, and it was after you left that I corresponded it so powerfully to this high priestess card. And it may just look, so it's called the Vexiloid of Baden, Garde du Court, uh, which has the word Baden in it. But now look at the uh, shape of this bounty. It's got, a, it's got this uh, pyramid, a triangle, a three-sided shape is a pile of cannonballs. Well, at the bottom of the high priestess card is a camel. And that might not sound like a perfect relationship, but camel is three. And look right next to the camel is a pile of grapes, just like the pile of cannonballs on the Vexiloid of Baden up here. Uh, very compelling to me. And what is Baden's vice president? Her name is Kamala. She is La Camel. She's the camel. It's all here. All the signs and symbols are here. And then uh, if you go up a little more chance, you can see that this high priestess, she's got that weird headdress. Can I add something to this for you? Because the Vexiloid of Baden Garde du Corps, they are specifically the Royal Guard. And I know that you've said a lot in the past about how the officers of the Pharaoh are called eunuchs and they are the Royal Guards, just like uh, Manchal Obama you is probably it, a type of bodyguard for the high priestess here. Barack. Right, right. So a little further up uh, on this graphic, you can see she's got this weird headdress that it, it could be. I think I actually read that it is an egg. 
Uh, so I got into the, the description of the High Priestess card, and I learned all kinds of next-level stuff. Well, that symbol shows up later when they're in the chamber of the uh, in, the so-called Inead. Yes, yes. This headdress on a statue. So it uh, it is. It's connected to an egg in an interesting way. So uh, this thing with Biden falling recently, look how his shoes match the cap of the marshmallow, the cap of the marshmallow container, the cap of the pin, uh, that royal blue of his shoes seemed he... So uh, the whole thing seemed like a ritual to me. I think it was a uh, a summer solstice ritual. He's got the egg head. He's got the white hat on, like the just like this headgear of the high priestess. Uh, and he was going through a liminal space, and he crashed at the end like a fool card. He fell, and then two minutes later, after his fall, he pulls some lady aside for a photo op with his dog. Biden's next to his dog getting his picture taken. That's the fool card. Fool card has a dog by his side. So the whole thing was like a fool high priestess uh, initiation uh, ritual, as far as I could tell. Uh, very interesting, very interesting. And then the other component uh, that I put together a few weeks back, but it has consistency because we're talking about this uh, this democratic agenda is the fact that Barack Obama's name is encoding pomegranate. A barracks bomb, the perfect bomb for the barracks is a hand grenade. And the word palma granata is hand grenade. So the pomegranates of the high priestess card are very uh, subtly encoding a uh, Yep, a barrack bomb, Baraka Bama, is a hand grenade, is a palma granite, which is an icon of the Torah of the interior side of the temple here. And she's holding the uh, scroll of the Torah in her hands. Well, Barack Obama, he adheres to a form of cabinet called the Team of Rival. Team of Rivals, T-O-R. So he is upholding the T-O-R. And, and he's a lawyer. I mean, in this case, that scroll represents like the law. And that guy yes. was a lawyer. So there's yes. that. So it has been a, a very fascinating. Uh, I mean, look series. at the pillars. Barack, the black guy on the left. Joe, the white guy on the right. Bingo. You got it, brother. You totally got it. So we are absolutely so when they put this in Marvel and in uh uh kind of idolize when they idolize this symbol, it's I believe for the public, it's being channeled over uh to the presidency, to the position of the president. Uh and a theory that I have is that the uh the solstice line is the democratic agenda, the blues. And I think that maybe the Equinox line could be the Republicans because I've uh, correlated the Emperor card to Trump. And there, uh, there's more to fill out in that theory. But I think we have the verticality is Democratic and the horizontal is Republican. Uh, just a theory I'm working on. Okay. <laughs> one, of our, one of our intrepid listeners here just put this in your Telegram channel. Uh, I've got to share it because apparently she was prescient to what you're talking about here. Uh, from 2015, Jen Brew Instagram post, Obama granite. Holy fuckity fuck, fuck, fuck. Holy fuckity <laughs> fuck, fuck. That's why I put it up here to see. I wanted to see a reaction in on your face. Who, who said, was that Jen? Is that our yeah. JB? That's yeah, our JB? That's a JB. Oh my gosh! Total, total profit, profit, total profit status, absolute yeah. profit status. Nicely uh, done. So, Chance, can you bring up the next one I sent you? Because it, because uh, if anybody was doubting, if anybody had any hesitation or any reservations that Barack Obama may or may not be implicated into this scene, let's look real close at the opening line. Let's look real close at the opening line. The very first thing she says when she initiates us into the into this scene 
First of all, I want to say Hecate. She who carries two torches. She gets her picture taken. Flash. Then she gets her, her picture taken again. Flash. That's two torches. She's, she's definitely embodying Hecate. And later on, she does it again when she, uh, Hecate is she who takes long strides, the long strider, the far darter, uh, many names for Hecate. She embodies it throughout. We'll get to that later. But look at these lines. Look at this, this sentence. And then I found him with the scarab. You take those letters in reverse and you get the opening line of the Torah. What? Barashit. Barashit. When you read the word scarab and the in reverse, it's Barashit, the very opening line of the Torah. And also, it's Barack <laughs> Obama's first name. Barack. Barack Sheet. <laughs> Barack Obama bullshit is being put on display. And then uh, and then I just kind of played around with the remaining because I that was as far as it went. The rest of it kind of turned into uh garbledy gook. So I just kind of messed with the remaining letters and I get like what was it? Pull it back up. To, oh, found found then I DNA. Uh is very interesting because of Freeman Fly's theory about Barack Obama being Akhenaten. Very interesting that found I then DNA is what you read when you keep going in reverse in that phrase, in that initiation. Uh, and then can you pull it back up, Chance? I, there's something else in there. Barack's initials are, <laughs> are really funny. He's got an amazing sense of humor. He's from the Royal Order of Jesters in Hawaii. And they are joking all day long. I mean, they are joking. They are clowning us all day long. And if you're not in the club, you're not going to get the joke. But so his initials are BHO. And if you put a urbanic twang to BHO, you get BHO. <laughs> it's the bitch ho. It's the biatch ho. But it's also you can play around with uh, uh, some of the gamatria and it's H2O. He, uh, he is constantly, uh, even before he was president, he was in public sipping water. He's the Mississippi. He's representing that Mississippi. Very, very fascinating to me that so many times Barack Obama is sipping on water. And he's always got his pinky up. They give him too short of a glass because he's a big dude. So he's always got the royal pinky when he sips his water. Mississippi. Pretty fascinating stuff. <laughs> what a journey we just went on <laughs> man i don't know how your brain does that man like i love i don't think it's his brain guys, doing because, it yeah no it's something else it's it's out here yeah i just i love hearing you just showing up for these things because you guys don't think like me and i love that i love that like we are intellectually challenged in regular life <laughs> ever so you know getting getting around people who who challenge our thoughts and like help us make us grow and like like push us to think other things like this whole thing sent me on you know doing this stuff sent me on this mirror research that that sent me off with uh, Romy and you guys like I am finding that stuff in here all the whole time just wait till we get to the little Little horsey show. Oh man. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Again, appropriate with all the horse talk that we had last night on Vibrant. Right? It's weird how it's all timing up like that. Mm -hmm. So weird. And so cancer so weird. and the chariot and what time of year we're in. So official health. That is, that's so deep. Official yeah. health. That's yeah. why, that's what they tell our moms. Our moms are like, maybe I don't want to cut my baby's dick. And they're like, no, it's official. It's for, it's for official health. health. You know, if we can make it official, like everybody does it. So it's official. Oh, that's how like, most rape happens in this society is for public health and or public turned, good, whatever. Same thing. And we just turned a blind eye. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about, um, you know, was talking with my family about all the, the pedophiles getting busted. Oh, by the way, that this, uh, this is linking back to the Marvel stuff that I don't know if we brought this up. I think we did on the spiders um, that um, in Dr. Strange, the woman who played the um, brunette zealot was, 
was busted with her husband, um, uh, who was a, they were busted for sex trafficking. Um, that's just in Dr. Strange. Now in this one, we're not quite there yet in the storyline, but uh, homie goes, homie goes down. Like one of our boys in this episode is no more. So, I mean, shits, if, if these things are real, which I take with a grain of salt that anything Disney says, anything Disney says, because, I, you, okay, Ethan Hawke, convince me that you you came up with this ritual. I, you're full of shit. Speaking anyway, of Ethan Hawke. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, do you want to... Well, you finish your this? thought. I just... I'm, t- I'm moving us in that direction for time. Yeah, no, but, get us there. That's it's. This is well, cool. Gabriel this is went on that whole rant about the high priestess, and the very next, mm-hmm. the very next scene is this guy discovering the tomb of his high priestess, uh, Ahmet. Yes, the, the bad guys have found it. Yeah, w- one thing that jumped out to me was, and I because I've seen now, I think I've watched it four times in preparation. <laughs> so I'm like. Uh, but I noticed that they go back and forth between indoor to outdoor to indoor to outdoor. And so we go uh, private, public, private, public. That's also a checkerboard floor. We go from dark to light to dark to light Ooh. to dark to light uh, throughout. So that's the first thing I thought of when this scene came on. He He's holding the birthright. The scarab is the birthright. He also has a very placental looking headdress uh that very much looks like uh the baby born with a higher calling like danny from the shining uh is there anything else in the scene should i move forward this one wasn't a whole lot it was just kind of moving the plot forward exposition you know top clocks ticking tick tock mark that's a (laughs) it's a line later in the episode he finds it everybody celebrates and then he's uh so Then it goes to Mark is chasing a guy who he thinks is at the, um, was at the two or had information. He chases them to these guys on the rooftop. They Mm -hmm. stab the dude and then try to take him in a knife fight. Uh, Mr. Arab pirate man. Yeah. Yeah. One thing on that last scene. Like dance fighting. (laughs) Yeah. It's the dance fighting. It's very I want, was, I, want uh, to point, I want to point out that he's using a compass to find that place. And then he is showing, this is the only scene where he shows compassion. The compass to Zion is compassion. And so he turns to his little minions and he actually pats him on the back and like shows uh, whatever, compassion. It's uh, And they have a little celebration. So that's just something I was thinking about uh, on that scene, but that's about all I got on that. It's an exodus too. It's clearly like an exodus. They're following Moses through the desert. They're going through the wilderness to find, you know, promised land, so to say. Yes, very much so. Um, then one thing I wanted to say about this fight scene that ensues, it's mostly just like an action scene, but uh, well, there's some elements of it that are important, but this guy. Okay. So right before this, we had, the tip of the marshmallow getting bit off. And we've already had reason to suspect that this is a circumcision thing. And then here we have the moil licking the blood off of the phallus, sucking the phallus of, of the baby after it's cut. That's how I interpret why in the hell would they even bother? Like, what is the point right. of this? Why is this guy licking this knife in a very weird sexualized way? This is, I think this is the bris ritual. Oh yeah, and the 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 baby of the group. To be clear, Chris- Mark is the, the character. Mark is Jewish in this show too. Oh right, right, yep. Yeah. Uh, and it's the baby of the group, the youngest of the three, uh, who gets special treatment, shall we say, the younger of the three. And in the fight, that young, the young one, he uh, he throws. He has a throwing knife, and he throws it at them at Mark. And misses, but he says, uh, "What's he say? Uh, in your in your face, foreigner." 
the subtitles translate his his little line and he says in your face foreigner and then he throws the knife and that's just interesting because he only has like three or four lines this the young one of the of the three and he's got the red scarf he's got the hecate the sof hecate and that will come into play in just a minute Ooh. Oh man, yeah. I knew I figured you wouldn't miss this. One thing I didn't grab a screenshot of though is there's like this half of a tarp or something in the corner on this roof that is that weird, it stands out as odd, this like toxic neon green color that we saw so much of in Spider-Man No Way Home. And I hadn't exactly figured out why they were putting that color in so bright and so like not in your face, but clearly jumping out of the background uh, with this scene in particular. Not sure. Usually that co that color, I think, has to do with making you scared of something. It has yeah. to do with poison and toxin. Yeah, it's the unnatural green. But, uh, okay, so he licks the knife. Oh, and then we see... I think this is one of the first parts of the many, many times in this episode, and I didn't get a screenshot of all of them, but many of them were talking to yourself through the mirror. And in particular, you know, that line, we're going to keep calling back to it, I think. It's easy to get stuck, fixate on what's hurt us. And, um, you know, the trauma of violence is something that he's fixated on uh steven can't get over it he every time mark gets into a fight steven's trying to take control of the body and make him stop and he does he takes control of the body and lets the guys go and then mark wakes up in the body in a cab and he sees the he's on his way to the airport and he sees the guys walking down the street and they and he gets out and chases them again and he has to do the whole song and dance <laughs> again of fighting these guys and uh Here's that color again, and I tried, but I just didn't have the chops to translate what, maybe there's an Arabic, Egyptian Arabic speaker in the crowd, but I did not have the chops to translate this. I really, really wanted to know, and I couldn't find mm. any answers on the Google machine about it either. Yeah, so there's okay. that, but again, he's just seeing himself in the mirror, Stephen coming through the mirror saying, quit being so violent, Mark. And yeah. uh, then the fight it's bad because you know he's is dragging on too long and uh they both black out and when mark comes back into consciousness he's two of these assailants are dead and steven's like what did you do and mark's like you did it and, and neither so we have confirmation that there's a third persona that took the wheel and killed these other guys yeah for whatever reason we don't know who that persona is yet so right. lots of symbolism here's the blood on the knife you know the, the deed has been done. The uh, <laughs> the foul is chopped, whatever. And uh, then the third guy, he's interrogating this guy. And Conchu is like, hold him over. The, the big bird god Conchu is like, hold him over the ledge. He'll talk. And uh, the guy says, praise Amit, cuts the scarf and falls to his death. So he commits suicide with a red scarf. And if anybody is heard of this the red scarf suicides it's a very common motif amongst hollywood in particular where somebody who um, was causing trouble in the in some way or they were troubled in the hollywood scene or for the cult they are said that they killed themselves but usually it's really odd like they hung themselves from a doorknob with a red scarf uh, and coming to mind i know that that was how robin williams was said to have killed himself but I know there's way more. It's like a consistent thing, the red scarf suicide. So this guy commits suicide with the red scarf. And uh, to me, that's just like, hey, conspiracy researchers, we know <laughs> we know that you're watching this and we know you're onto us, but what are you going to do about it? Here it is, red scarf suicide. Well, and he's also, they're also kind of saying that these, these people are killing themselves. Look, and he, so what he does is he cuts, he pulls out the knife and cuts the scarf instead of, you know, like letting it go. He cuts the scarf, giving giving the guilt to himself. He's not he didn't get killed. He he killed himself. Like these people are doing it to themselves. You know, they didn't. They, they weren't. This guy wasn't murdered. He killed right. himself. Um. So the little earth Easter egg is is his jacket right there. Just before he he. Uh, do you want me to share that, or you got that? 
chance. I don't have it pulled up. I'm actually I might have it pulled up in another tab. Hold on a second. Yeah, that was a great catch. That is so and it flashed so quickly. Yeah, it took me so what I did was I I caught the I knew it was something. I just I couldn't figure out what it was. Yeah. So I did the the image Google reverse search, you know, for the the thing and that's when um the thing about um okay. So that right there is I didn't I couldn't figure out what that was, but I did a Google image search on that back logo and it came up with that uh, uh, rum and tut um, headdress thing, which is basically, um, uh, what's his name? Kang the Conqueror. So the storyline in Marvel, this is a Kang the Conqueror Easter egg. The storyline is that Kang goes back to, one of his incarnations is uh, this Egyptian god Raman Tut, because he goes back, he's he's messing with time travel, and he goes back to ancient Egypt and becomes a god because of the stuff he knows, and he's got a gun or something, you know, and so they worship him as a god. And every time he does this time, um, <clears throat> the time manipulation, he creates a new reality. So here's that multiverse thing again, but. Um, what is really interesting, the, uh, so this top on, of his, the emblem on his back is the headdress of the uh, Ramatut. So essentially the storyline with Ramatut is that um, he, was, he was messing around with time, you know, Kang was messing around with time, shoots himself back into ancient Egypt and um, uh, Baal, of all gods finds him and revives him, brings him back to life. So really interesting that uh, you would, would bring up the, uh, the uh, bull Gabriel in the, uh, is it, you've got that later on coming up? Yeah, that'll come up in the, in the trial, but I chance I shot a picture of Rama Tut to you uh, that, that Gordy shared in the group there. And it, the headdress is perfect. It's a perfect match to the high priestess. It's freaking, it's amazing. That is so amazing. He looks like he doesn't have any junk. <laughs> He's rocking mm. a smoothie. <laughs> rocking he looks a like smoothie. a smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds great. me of Zardoz. The penis is bad. The gun <laughs> is good. <laughs> Wow. So this guy is an old, is this um, a Marvel? Is this a, a, from yeah, the this Marvel? Is, this is, yeah, this is a Jack Kirby, the old, old school Jack Kirby uh, villain. And he was a, uh, Ramatut was a time traveling pharaoh who would come and somehow he, they fought uh, um, the Fantastic Four fought him. And then I think the the whole time travel thing might have been a retcon. Um, you know how they like to add those storylines to it and then mm -hmm. have him being King the Conqueror, you know, going back, which is always clever storytelling. Um, but this is how we, they change mythology. You know, you see uh, some kid sees a wiki that an actual god, Baal, resurrected this guy, Ramatut, and then they think that Ramatut was a real god. Or in the in the... The Pantheon, or the what do they call it? The Ennead. Yeah. Yep. So the, these are the kind of things that that they do change the myth. I think, I think kind of you know somewhat innocently. Um, when I was a kid, I remember thinking about that chance the the uh, manipulation of myth because of like you know Clash of the Titans is fucking fantastic, and I love how cheesy it still is, but. Um, it's not telling that story correctly. It really isn't. But, you know, with the Medusa and the, and the Kraken and all that. But, it, I mean, essentially it's kind of the same. That it's, you know, it takes a lot of liberties. And so we think this happened when it weren't, really wasn't Perseus, you know, or whatever. Um, and things like this. You know, we, we think that Khonshu had a, we mispronounced the word Khonshu. And 
like there will be uh, all these uh, comic book nerds now that think that Kansu has a has a crow head or right. an ibis, you know, instead of a falcon, right? It's, which changes its or that he has the power to resurrect completely. people. Right. He's not a god of healing or resurrection in Egyptian lore at all. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, like that. I, I find a fine line between uh, appropriation and destructiveness. <laughs> you know, it's like it's a real fine line. Like you, it, anybody in in California or in America presuming to uh, alter Egyptian history is uh, it, it gets really uh, foggy. We'll just say that it gets really foggy. Uh, so that, that kid, the kid who gets, who gets whatever off yeah. the cliff, mm -hmm. he's a kid being offed over the edge of a cliff. It's a Yom Kippur ritual. And uh, in and it's now, his fault, so he's a scapegoat. He's a scapegoat. Isn't uh, the tower I mean, really, one? and like the bad guys escape the fate of Mark getting the information he wanted through him killing himself. He's an escape goat, an escape right. kid. Yes. And at the end of the Yom Kippur ritual, there's a piece of cloth that changes. It changes from uh, from red to white. I think it becomes purified. And it's just very interesting that as he falls, the red cloth gets dropped down with him, uh, down below. Uh, Chance, can you bring up that uh, the one before Rama Tut that I sent? So the kids, the kid only has a few lines in the whole in the whole show. You know, he says, "In your face, foreigner," uh, and then he says, uh, "Let us go." Uh, when uh, when Mark sees the kid and the other guy in the city, he jumps out of the cab and he starts like trying to question them. And the kid says, let us go. And I think that's really interesting because he's foreshadowing his own death. Like he only has a few lines and his lines are seem incredibly well calculated. He says, let us go. And that's how he ends up dying by letting himself go. So to say, and Pharaoh, then, let my people go. Nice. Nice chance. Great catch. And then the and then the last thing he says, his final words is praise Ahmet. And uh that's just interesting to me. It's a 31 in septenary. So there's that Belfagor's prime, the uh PA in septenary. Um, but this was this was just really neat. Um, I was researching the high priestess card. And I found out that the imagery of the High Priestess card is a inspired by a classical painting. In the classical painting, I can hardly let's see, I can pull it up. It is San Michel Al Isola, Al Is Al Isola, and I think that means Saint Michel of the Island is a very famous painting and that's this painting here and that is part of the inspiration for Frida Harris who may be related to Kamala and she's the artist that made the high priest all the art of the Fowley, uh, Crowley Thoth deck and so this image is something I was holding in my mind uh, at, through the whole the whole series this very interesting ancient ruins on water because the high priestess is uh, she represents the ripples of the water uh, reflecting the moon to be technical. Um, but this is, appears to be uh, some sort of priestess or a white garbed, maybe sacrificial offering or a priestess going to a remote temple location. And there's a, a person pushing the boat behind her who's wearing red. So the, the, uh, the ferryman is wearing red and she's wearing white. Those are the two colors of the Yom Kippur ritual. Um, and he's bringing her to the ledge. He's bringing her up to this little dock in this ancient ruins of this San Michel Alelis or whatever the name of this place is. And if you look at the background, if you scroll up there, Chance, 
look at the background of the ruins that they're located at in this scene. It matches the ruins of the classical painting. And Kanchu is telling him, take him to the ledge. That's what's going on in the classical painting. He's being taken to the ledge. And then he says, he's just a kid. And then Kanchu says, he'll, he'll talk. And then he says, where is the tomb? Well, that, that San Michel Al Isola is a tomb. It's a location, it's a island uh, that is a sacred burial location. Uh, and it has other associations and echoes throughout history. It's been depicted in other ways. But I just found that very interesting that that famous painting seems to have been encapsulated in episode three here a couple times, actually. Uh, and the High Priestess card is uh, card number two, uh, but it is the third card if you count the Fool card. So there is something going on with the... Uh, the two to the three and uh, that iconography of that high priestess. Uh, and also, I can't help but think about the kid. He says he's just a kid. And then the, you know, the Yom Kippur thing happens. Oh, and that is, uh, takes place almost like a few minutes before a eclipse uh, Kanchu summons an eclipse and sacrifices yeah. correspond with an eclipse. So it's just so steeped in sacrificial energy. The kid, the cliff, the eclipse, it's just got sacrifice written all over it. Yeah. And the other thing about the eclipse. So first of all, you were talking about that Island on the Nile. Interesting that the Nile is another word that encodes black. Actually, oh, yeah, refers to black. Uh, <laughs> it's also a Greek a generic term for river. So, uh, yes. So, yep. It's a generic term for river. Yeah. And, and according to Dylan, Nihilus is an a early form of Jesus or Bacchus. So mm. we're talking about the black God, which is Osiris as well. It's all kind of one thing when you get into the syncretism of it, but the eclipse happening is interesting to me because Kanshu causes this eclipse to force the other gods to notice that they need to get together. It's like a signal, like the yeah, bat signal for the other gods. He says, I'm sending a signal they can't ignore. And egg noir is black fire, dark fire. Egn is dark. And no, Egn is fire, I G N, and Noir is dark. Yeah, so. and in the history of these priest class cults and their controlling the masses, one of the things that they had on as astronomers on the regular folk was that they could predict eclipses. And they would say, like, oh, you better do what we say and give us enough money to build this temple we need and let us extort you enough. So that if uh, if you don't, then, you know, the sun's going to go away. It needs blood. You need to give more blood to the ground, more sacrifices. So the fact that he's causing this eclipse to manipulate something to happen, it's kind of in reverse of what the priest would claim to be able to do, which is like, oh, yeah, we caused that eclipse because you weren't doing enough. So, yeah, <laughs> you follow my drift here. Totally. And something this was I was poaching off of other people's uh, Easter egg stuff that they've done on the show. And I found some interesting gems in this eclipse scene. It turns out there's a sacred mosque in the historical district of Cairo that gets a uh, focus shot as the shadow rolls through uh, Cairo. And let's see if I can pronounce the name of this place. I think it's called... Uh, the mosque, okay, it's called the Madrasa Mosque of Sultan Hassan is the name of the location that they actually focus on. And I did a little bit of digging, but I got to point out, Hassan is Barack Obama's middle name. And it's very interesting. The, if you look at the, the, some of the history of that building that gets eclipsed in, this, in the shot, it was made by a child a child sultan who was not fully in power. 
The nation was weak. There were plagues at the time that it was built. There were uh, turmoil and strife. Uh, there was a lot of war in the time that that mosque was built. So I'm quite sure they're kind of nudging at some of the history of that mosque in that location. And then immediately after, they show the eclipse going over the actual Sphinx very briefly. And I just got to point out that the Sphinx gets ignored in the Bible. The Pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx is totally ignored. Dark fire throughout the, the whole Bible. It's not even in there. So it's almost like uh, uh, it's almost saying that the pyramids and the mosque are artifacts that were put in place so that history could not ignore them. Just a thought. Hmm. That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting thing about the, the pyramids at Giza too, is that they did not have hieroglyphs on them. So no. they either came from a time when hieroglyphs weren't a language yet or hieroglyphs were added to the other temples and pyramids, smaller tem uh, temples and pyramids later. Or they were made by people who don't believe in written language. Yeah. Who? Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. The, uh, the, we just found, I just, I can't believe I just uh, ignored this. I, Gobekli Tepe has a newer, um, um, discovery supposedly there's a newer city that was buried over like Gobekli Tepe that has uh, language on its walls too but the pyramids didn't like South America totally did on all of their pyramids the on all of the you know North American we didn't have um, there weren't uh, hieroglyphs but there's clearly sim symbology like we use symbology there's none of that on the on the pyramids themselves. Now they say they're inside, but who the hell knows what they've actually shown is really what's actually in there. And the only person I know that I I am so glad the conversation went this way cuz I had this weirdest um one of and I think it was Andrea uh somebody in my group, my conspiratorium group. Yeah. Cozy Crone. Yeah, Cozy Crone. Yeah, that's that's her. So she posts this. Um, can I? Well, she. I'll I'll share it in the show notes. It's it's basically Minnesota has um, put out this thing to uh, they they want to host the next World's Fair in 2027, and I've got to show you guys the picture. That uh, let's see, share screen. Um, I want to share a window. Where's my safari? Oh, this stupid thing here. You can always forward me things too. Yeah, let me forward you things. I'm sorry. So, sorry, it's a board game. <laughs> here we go. World's Fair is a Wheel of Fortune, a WF, a 56, that's the Minor Arcana, it's the numbered people, and I think Minnesota is up in uh, uh, Gemini. Here, I'm just going to drop it in the telegram. Be interesting if they did it near the solstice. Well, okay, so another interesting thing I just want to throw out there is that the Pot potentially, or it is thought that the culture that built the big pyramids that we're talking about that have no hieroglyphics on them were from the time of the old kingdom where the sun was venerated in the form of the Apis built bull or the Apis bull. And Hathor, who is an important character in this, was important, leading us to think maybe this was the age of Taurus. And what were the cultures called that created them in South America? The Mayans, the Mayans, the May Sun, oh the age of Taurus, same goodness. time. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. Dang. That comes in during in the trial with the conversation with Hawthorne. Damn, that is cool. <laughs> oh, man. 
Oh, there's going to be revelations <laughs> for weeks on that. That is great. Here it is. Yeah, thank you, Chance. This is what they're proposing. This is this is the actual um, image from the Minnesota uh, radio station that this article comes from. That Minnesota has put in the uh, this bid for the 2027 World's Fair. This is the the image they chose that they want to. Uh, you know how. Each World Fair, if you've ever noticed like on their, on the um, advertising or whatever, the trinkets are, and stuff, they always have like a, a building or some sort of landmark thing, you know, like it's like Epcot has the big sphere or whatever. And uh, Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower was for the Paris one. And, but this, if chance you would flip to the next one, Looks exactly like that. Well, not exactly, but <laughs> not exactly. No, I, 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 I mean, see. You know what I'm I saying. see where you're going with it. I'm just making a joke. This is, totally. is, in fact, it's it's almost more of a torsion version of this. So this is the ziggurat that was the Tower of Babel. This is an illustration of for the Tower of Babel, and it even has the path going to that building. That's that looks like this. So, I mean, World's Oh, Fair, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's definitely a symbolic resets. match here. Their history resets. I'm sure that Howdy's on to something with this stuff. And we're definitely getting a history reset right now in a Fahrenheit 451 way with all the digital book burning. Get everyone on the internet and then start, then kill the internet, basically. The dead internet. Right. Yep. Controlled demolition, for sure. What was the the commission that the guy in 1984 worked for? He was actually his job was that was going through history and revising it, right? Oh yeah, uh, he was. Uh, uh, he worked at the word, like the the dictionary place. Was it wasn't that it? Oh, it was the dictionary, right, right, right. He yeah, was he was like the editing the dictionary editing words, right? Yeah, yeah, good point, man. Yep, he yeah. worked for Wik We Keep Idea, is basically yeah. where he yeah, was. Essentially, yeah. I mean, yep. we see it change all the time. I mean, I've gone, looked at an article, gone back, you know, not even a half hour later, it's gone or changed or whatever. How many times have we had, all of us had posts that were taken down? Or, or like the Masonic tracing boards that one day just became different letters on them instead of J and B, it was like what, S and B after that? Yeah, as soon as huh. they get a JB as the president, they're like, maybe we're being a little too obvious. Maybe we should change one of the letters to S. <laughs> and they did. I mean, thoroughly. I mean, we had to dig and dig. You can still find J and B Masonic tracing boards, Joachim and Boaz. But now they've got some kind of, they've weaseled in some kind of S is now 80%. That is not how it was. That happened right in our lifetime, right in the course of a couple months it seems yeah like. quick quick little editing potential they've got at their fingertips there so where are we at in the story here we would be at the point where the portal opens for oh, them no. to be summoned into the uh the supposedly to the inside of the great pyramid of giza into a secret chamber yes so just okay. the idea that there's a secret chamber in the pyramid of giza uh howdy's talked about that a lot and mentioned that he his his conjecture that there are areas that are not accessible to the public. First of all, there's an entire underground city beneath the Giza Plateau, and that is not even in that is not even an occult thing. It is well known. They just tell you you can't go down there; you could die. Uh, how do you even has a story about that? He said that he uh, was about to go down there, <laughs> and the the guide or the guard or whatever that he probably like greased greased up to uh, be allowed to go in because they're very bribable there and will even kind of extort people <laughs> in a sense they how'd he change his mind because the guy's like you could die down there it's very dangerous so he didn't go but anyway it's his conjecture that some of these areas are not accessible unless you're like a frequency match um 
for the area and that they could be dangerous or cause you to get sick or just straight up die. But on top of that, in the underground areas, you know, you could just take a fall or something could fall on you or you could drown, all kinds of things like that. But anyway, they go into this secret chamber of the, you know what? <laughs> I also want to bring up something. Um, I'll, I'll show this, but the Assassin's Creed Origins game, which is the Assassin's Creed game that takes place in ancient Egypt, right at the same time that that game came out and it had a secret chamber in the Great Pyramid, there was a ground penetrating radar scan done of the Great Pyramid that found a hidden chamber that was not that no one knew how to get to, but they could tell that it was there, that there was a cavity there. Yeah. Hmm. So those the things happened at the same time. Yes. So look here, Gabriel. There's the top of the high priestess here. Yep. There it is. Top of the high priestess head. There's the two pillars. Yeah. J and the B here. There's the uh, the ball cutter. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see. I know that the screenshots are dark. I do not know why they come through darker on Streamyard. It is what it is. But I can. I got a better picture of the ball cutter. I'll get to you here in a sec. There's that's what also I'm talking about. Yeah, that's good. That's good. There's also a uh, Bastet. Uh, Bast is in. Do you see it? It's very. Yeah, you got it. That's it. They got Bast in the in the mix there. And it's interesting. A lot because, of gods represented that are not the Ennead. Yes. I'll just say that. But good call. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't they specifically say we got to summon the Ennead? Like that they're going to be talking to the Ennead. Yes, and then and Kanchu even says. Uh, when you when the council is summoned, the portal can appear anywhere, and the word any it uh, sums up to a, a nine. It means nine in I think in Greek, ania means nine, and uh, and then as he says it, a portal opens right behind him. Uh, I believe they're talking about hyperspace i think they're talking about dream time i think they're talking about the uh that uh hyper dimensional reality that tracy twyman was on to uh that only the initiated can get access to that's what i think he means when he says that uh uh you know but it could be a frequency thing you know there could be devices that'll bring up the frequency uh to open the gates and so uh I sent you a picture here, Chance, of a, uh, and this is from other Marvel works, but it's a picture of Bastet from the comic book. And there's just a very interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Black Panther. Yeah. Black Panther and Moon Knight are like a J and a B themselves. You got the, they both serve the Egyptian gods. Right. But one wears a black costume and one wears white. Right. And one's a black dude, one's a white dude. Yeah. Good call. So, on the this face paint of Bastet, I'm seeing I'm seeing a toxoplasmosis. The word to, the shape of a toxoplasmosis is a bow shape. That's how it gets its name. So this little graphic is indicating the power of the toxoplasmosis as the as a demiurge, uh, in my opinion. And, uh, I've I am of the school of thought that the toxoplasmosis has been weaponized and is used to make proxy warriors uh, in uh, expediently to alter people's decision-making and uh, probably compromise them in major ways. But I just find that so profound that they put what looks to me like a toxoplasmosis on the face of this cat that is so... Uh, telling in my opinion i think you're right on and it's one of those things that did the artist even know what they were putting in there or is it like oh this looks like a good design but it's just encoding something that is true or resonant to reality right right and can you while we're at, before we go in the temple just, just so we get all the goodies and all the hanging chads can you bring that one uh of Kanchu where he's walking away that i sent Ooh, that's sketchy imagery, but you get the idea. So, yeah, he says, aren't you coming? Like, I'm going to go address the council. Aren't you coming with me? 
And as he walks away, as he's turned his back on him, he says, oh, I'll be there. And uh, it it says, you know, he's speaking in this knowing. I got to start way. watching these with subtitles so that these little anagrams and uh, word magics come out more. Damn. You got it. You got it. So I broke that. I broke that little phrase up and I see oil be the re. And at first I was thinking, oh, yeah, oil is the reason why we go and invade other countries. Other is the reason why we have to uh, maybe uh, open a one world court or open America to the one world court uh, because we uh, infiltrate other countries for their oil. But then I was like, no, let, let's not. Let's just stick with the R.E. because R.E., is also uh, spelled R-A or pronounced as Ra in Egyptian mythology. And you guys know where I'm going with this. I don't have to read the whole caption. But basically, oil be the ray is a very interesting thought that he might have subtly been indicating that um, maybe there are sacred oils in particular uh, that the uh, that are part of the Egyptian mysteries. We'll just leave it that way. Uh, you know, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. There's a lot to speculate on what might have really been intended in there, but that's just something I saw. And uh, the back of the head is another thing that's going to come up later. Uh, I've got a little mini weave going with the back of the head and uh, turning a blind eye. Uh, he is always hitting the back of his head other, and then other personalities come into play. So back of the head is a, is a, kind of a theme that will will bake into the pie later hmm i want to read <clears throat> i want to read a little bit here from a god's acre for winds of the soul by dylan sicosio so he had just in the previous paragraph been talking about the river of the sun and all the different famous rivers that encode that meaning nile included and he brought up that in he, he's doing a whole bunch about like the number 608 and the, um, the Nero cycle, but he brings up Frey in Greek, which is uh couldn't tell you what the Greek letters are called, but it's F H R E when transliterated to English. So this is the first half of Pharaoh. Okay. And then the second half is Rho, which the Hebrew Rho is in R A O R O H is an active participle meaning he or she who feeds pastors grazes or tends and has a unique root that is opposite meanings depending on the context as a masculine noun it means evil but it also means friend so when you combine ro with fray or free pharaoh you get friend of the sun or friend of god but also one who pastures or feeds on behalf of god like a, basically like you know, your shepherd symbolism of your sun god, uh, son of God. So even if Frey did, wasn't, or free, the Greek, wasn't part of Pharaoh and uh, Egypt, uh, he says, and Egypt is a product of Rome, which is his suspicion, then far or fair, F-A-R, as in Pharaoh, F-A-R-O, that's a word that is a type of grain. In, in Africa. So oh, yeah. Pharaoh is one who feeds grain. <laughs> so there's that. And um, the row can also be spelled or like philologically linked to the, uh, the Raj, the RJ. And that's where you get words like Rajapout, which is what means Royal Buddha. Uh, it's a word for King in, uh, in Sanskrit, I think. So anyway, there's all kinds of interesting encodings in the word Pharaoh and the Pharaoh is like the supposed to be the, the man who is Ray or Ra, you know, yeah. incarnate, the son yeah. of God, I'm the thinking, king. I'm thinking initiate it. I'm thinking uh, placental magic is, an, is what I'm hearing between the lines there. So oh, let's yeah. move, move forward and hit to this Gabe or uh, Gordy, you got something, buddy? Uh, just fine. real quick. Also, uh, the big gambling game. If you go to all the w old West towns around here, uh, the gambling game was Pharaoh. It wasn't poker. It was Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh was a, was a card game, but it was also 
kind of a, a divination. It was essentially kind of a tarot thing, but they called it Pharaoh. It's a, and it's, it is a poker, I guess, but you know, it, it's all cards. The cards are divination too. I, that was the first time I ever heard of, of regular cards being um, um, used as, as a divination too was tombstone that apparently the, uh, the, uh, I'll be right back. You guys keep there, it going. Yeah. The prostitutes down there would, um, do, I guess they do divination on the side, you know, like a kind of a, a reading with regular Pharaoh cards, which they were, you know, it wasn't poker yet. I don't think, uh, poker was more of, a, I think a back East game, but here it was, and all throughout the Southwest was Pharaoh. And it always makes me wonder because when you see the um, the tapestries and stuff of the promotions for the um, nightlife at all the theaters, they mm-hmm. were they were obsessed with Egypt. Also, um, the biggest star who was essentially I mean we would call it a stripper now, but she was a performer. She wasn't she was a dancer. And um, she was named Little Egypt, was the the most uh, popular one. She was huge, like apparently she was internationally known, and she was like a nobody who would who would come around to all the all the the brothels and dance or something to mm-hmm. all the weird theaters that were all down here. And if you look at all the theaters too, I I was thinking about that. I think they all have the. I got to look at the birdcage next time I'm down there, but I think they all have that Tris, that three door thing. Oh yeah. Um, um, triune yeah. gate, the triune gate. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, of course. 1890s was like a history reset. That was like, um, mm. when they were totally, this is where that Victorian Egyptian mummy obsessed thing where people were burning mummies in their, it was the same time period, you know. Mm-hmm. And that triune—that's the—it's the three into one. It's the uh, even the troy ounce try on all of right. them, and that's all. Crazy enough, I mean, it's uh, it's all thirty-one or three into one, but it's so wild how uh, now that I know about the Belfagor thing, I'm like, man, the threes and the ones. Praise on it. What's the three-headed god? Which one is that? Hecate. We faced it's Hecate, right? Well, yeah. There's Isn't a lot that... of them. There's a lot of them, but Hecate is like it's the classic. Yep. I even think of it as the Ma Tri X, mm-hmm. the Ma of of Triple Cross, which goes to the the X gamma X is the sun symbol and the odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. C suns. Three sons, the, the Trinity, the three and one. Yeah. And as far as we know, right now we have we have Mark, and we have Stephen, and then this other guy who keeps uh-huh. showing up. They don't know who he is, right? Mm-hmm. Not yeah, mystery. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert: His name is Jake or <laughs> Jacob. 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 <laughs> Jacob mm-hmm. is a name that encodes the sun. Is also a son of God in code. Yep. And a very important character in terms of Old Testament mythology relating to Egypt as well. Yes. Um, I'm Sir pretty Planter. sure Joshua made a comment earlier about Jacob asks the Lord to make the sun stand still. And he does whenever we were talking about the eclipse thing. Nice. So anyway, there's that. Um, we should probably move forward in the plot, though. Yeah, Have take us gotten, take us in. We're we in gotten that part where where he turns the sky back, right? No, that's at the very end. Ooh. Yeah, we'll get there. But oh, first, man. okay, here's the legal proceedings. He's meeting with the other gods. Again, this is a very dim scene, but the first one he meets is the avatar of Hathor. So if this is supposed to be representative mm-hmm. of the Ennead, and I assume it is because, look, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then maybe like the ninth would be uh, Ra, <laughs> right? So there's I also the it. idea of the... Ogdoad in Egyptian, depending on where you go for the, uh, no surprise, in Hermopolis, which is named for Hermes, who's also known as Lord Eight, their creation story had an Ogdoad, which is different male-female pairs of gods. But the Ennead is the 
Heliopolis creation story. And that's so the, the main centers of Egypt each had different creation mythology. And that wasn't, they weren't, according to Howdy, they weren't in conflict. They weren't competing for an origin story. They were all well understood to be purely symbolic mythology that was not to be understood literally that these gods were out there and that the different versions of the creation story were just trying to explain to you different aspects of nature and different properties of, you know, how nature operates and begins. So anyway, the Ennead traditionally is supposed to be uh, Atum, who is also Ra, one of the forms of Ra, the old man version of Ra. Atom, Atom is where we get the name Adam, by the way. Atom, Adam, doesn't seem a big surprise. It's the winter sun. It's the black god. It's Kronos. It's all of those things. Um, it's the sun before it sets. That's Atom. That's what aspect of Ra it is. Anyway, this is from a Google search, so there could be conflicting ideas here. But as far as I know, this is ac accurate that the Ennead was Atom's children, Shu and Tefnut. We already brought up Shu. Tefnut is one of the characters represented here, by the way. Um, so Shu and Tefnut, their children, Geb and Nut, and then their children, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Sometimes the Ennead includes Isis and Horus. Um, or, can, sorry, includes Horus. Isis is, of course, part of it. So anyway, in this scene, we get five gods representing the Ennead. <laughs> so that's not nine. And the five we get are Horus, Isis, Tefnut, Osiris, Hathor, and uh, I guess you could say that Khonsu counts as one coming to this council. So maybe that's six. And then Amit is represented by uh, Harrow when he shows up. So just like the poster at the first episode where Stephen's like, hey, this is a poster for the Ennead, but there's only seven gods on here and the Ennead's nine. Yep. He fails to mention that Hathor is not part of the Ennead and she's on the poster, but hey. Yeah. Here's seven gods showing up to represent the Ennead. So again, they're, you know, elbowing us in the ribs and saying, hey, remember whenever we cut you off from your mother and father and from your roots and we, we cut off your feet, you were defeated, and now you are part of our septenary prism rather than <laughs> connected to the wholeness of the nine. Remember that? Remember that? Oh, of course you don't. Just enjoy the show, everybody. Pop some popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> So Hathor, Kansu, and Amit are not part of the Ennead. Uh, yeah. We all probably are pretty familiar with Horus and Isis. Uh, they're, you know, Horus is your Jesus, Isis is your mother Mary, but Tefnut is the consort of Shu. Shu was really important to our breakdown in the first episode. I uh, haven't thought as much about Shu as we went forward into these, but I have thought that it's interesting that Tefnut is included here because she's a goddess of moist air oddly enough <laughs> she's like they, they literally uh, correlated her with the fertility principle of like the vagina's fluids that were necessary for the act of procreation to happen but on a cosmic scale any form of life-giving moisture so uh -oh. it that makes me think of smell. Mo <laughs> moist air carries scent. So that is, and maybe they're maybe they're doing five senses. Maybe that's what they're paralleling. Whatever it is, they're going out of their way to scramble what it, what these systems used to be, and put them into uh, al almost a puzzle, a really. Uh, obtuse puzzle it's it's really confounding i thought uh, it might be worth reading the yeah. heliopolis creation myth it's the most popular one although the memphis one is really important too because that one centers on Ptah, who is peter who is the rock who is the who's vulcan all of that <laughs> very important but the heliopolis ennead creation story says this is from we keep idea but this is good enough it it's the commonly understood version of the story in Heliopolis, the creation was attributed to, to Atom, a deity closely associated with Ra. No, he was Ra. That's one of Ra's three in one identities. And he was so Atom was said to have existed in the waters of Nu, 
as an inert potential being. Atom was a self-engendered god, the source of all the elements and forces in the world. And the Heliopol Heliopolitan myth described the process by which he evolved. I like how they use that word. That is not the word the Egyptians probably would have said. <laughs> From a single being into this multiplicity of elements. I'm thinking Kurt Kallenbach, his version of evolution. And the uh, evolution of the zygote into the multicellular being. Nice. The process began when Atom appeared on the mound and gave rise to the air god Shu and his sister wife Tefnut, whose existence represented the emergence of an empty space amid the waters. To explain how Atom did this, the myth uses the metaphor of masturbation, with the hand he used in this act representing the female principle inherent within him, the left hand path. He is also said to have sneezed and spat to produce Shu and Tefnut, a metaphor that arose from puns on their names. So, in some versions, he masturbates them into creation. In some versions, he sneezes and spits. You know, when you sneeze, you get moist air. When you spit, you get water. So, that's Shu and Tefnut. A metaphor that arose from puns on their names. Yeah. Next, Shu and Tefnut coupled to produce the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut. And uh, Shu, of course, is the one that separates Geb and Nut to separate the waters from the skies and the earth and create the limits of the world, a.k.a. the firmament. Geb and Nut give rise to four children who represent the forces of life, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. So anyway, that's the uh, Ennead, but they're all extensions of Atom is what Wikipedia is saying. What they failed to mention is that they didn't believe this was a literally true story, that it, it was for sure allegorical metaphor for how nature creates things, which, yeah, that's that. Wanted to make sure we get into that. And here's the <clears throat> representation of the Ogduad. They're interesting because they've all got the heads of either snakes or frogs. Amphibious creatures. Hmm. Hmm. Cactastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... We get into the legal proceedings of this scene. I just want to point out a few things about it. Uh, the first avatar he means is the avatar of Hathor. Um, you know, there's the bull putting the primacy on the bull inside the Great Pyramid. Interesting because it possibly was constructed during the age of Taurus. Uh, right. We've talked a lot about Hathor in recent streams, of course, but the bull is Bell is Baal. And all that and she's the sun god yeah. um to talk more about hathor she was a one of the consorts of horus but also sometimes she was his mother <laughs> all right where have we seen that before the the mother marries her son who mm -hmm. is an, also a sacrifice in some way too interesting Oedipus. Um, mm -hmm. she had a vengeful aspect of course not unlike one of the versions of this same character, in my opinion, like um, Sekhmet, who bathed the world in blood, a bloodbath, not unlike the uh, rituals of uh, sacrificing a bull and standing underneath the sacrificial altar and getting a literal bath of the blood. That's a real thing. Um, so she was a boundary between worlds crosser, if you will, very Hecate in that sense. She's at the crossroads between worlds. Mm -hmm. She was a psychopomp of sorts, helping the deceased souls transition. And what else do I want to say about her? Um, I think that I'm good with that other than she represents music, dance, joy, love, sexuality, motherhood, all kinds of things. And she was the, she got it on. She was kind of like, you know, here's the thing about Zeus that isn't very often said. In mythology, there's reason to assume that Zeus assumed the form of a maid as often as he was a male. He's eternally a male, a maid and like a, a male war warrior type. So I think Hathor is similar to that character of Zeus in the sense that she, the way Zeus got around with all kinds of, and, and got it on with all kinds of other of the characters in the mythology, Hathor was like that too. She 
<laughs> she spread her sexual healing all over the place for several of the deities and mothered many children with different deities. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with the meeting of the Ennead is they all get possessed by their, the, all the avatars of these gods are showing up. So they're all people who are basically possessed by this being from the, what's called the Marvel calls it the uh, overvoid. They are called observers from the overvoid. From the, the opulence of the overvoid is an OTO. Right. And then, you know, the Ovid of it all in overvoid. <laughs> yes. But these are the, they're the watchers, man. These, these are people who are possessed by watchers. This is fallen angel stuff encoded in this Marvel show has nothing to do with the ancient Egyptian beliefs that the watchers from the overvoid were possessing human avatars and controlling them. But symbolically to the, to get, get us back to the whole law symbolism in this show, they're having, they're holding court. This is what they're doing. They're holding court. You know, Cyrus is the, the judge here, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. Uh, judge literally means God <laughs> or magistrate. Kind of like the word Medjai, which comes up later in the show. Magi, same thing. Uh, and basically, in a legal proceeding in court, the judge asks you if you are your legal name and your birthday, the all caps name. They want you to identify with the straw man, which might as well be the being that you're possessed by if you don't understand the difference between your I am self and the id entity that society has foisted upon you. So when these characters in this show as avatars, their watcher that's possessing them speaks through them and takes over their body during the legal proceeding, it is just like how in a courtroom, as soon as you say, yes, my name is such and such, and that is my birthday, and you agree to it, you are now the agent. <laughs> You're now act it's like in the matrix when the agent takes over the hobo's body. It's just like that. So I hope that's all making sense. I think for people that have studied it all, straw man and in the legal system, we'll get where I'm going with that without needing to overly analyze and explain it. But the symbolism is definitely there in this scene, big time. Big time. Yeah. As soon as he it uh, assumes that or confirms the presumption, as soon as he agrees to it, he becomes diminished. And he, he falls, he lowers himself to the ground. He becomes so weak, he can't even stand. And they're like, are you unwell? Senses. And he's like, I am unwell. Yep. And after that. And literally, the reason they're saying he's unwell is because he has split personalities, dude. So the court is judging him for his split personalities. Just like if you go to court and you agree that you're the straw man, they're going to pass judgment on your ass. Yep. Especially if they're you gonna split see you as unfit, as mentally ill. Right. Yeah. Okay. Especially if you uh, let somebody else take the helm, uh, there's mm -hmm. definitely a DID at its finest. It, uh, socially accepted DID. Uh, socially uh, expected. Yeah, they're going right. to correct you. They're going to salvage you. They're going right. to pirate your booty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this scene. Uh, a lot of interesting things popped out to me right away uh, as he walks into the arena uh, and there's that word arena again, that was in the, uh, the, the earlier episodes. Uh, but I sent you a graphic chance. Can you pull that up? Some of the uh, dialogue is really interesting. I saw some pretty worthwhile little nuggets in the narrative as they walk in. So these are screen caps off my TV. So excuse the, the quality of imaging, but so uh, the first one to walk in the room is actually Osiris very subtly off on the left-hand side and uh, Horus here, she, or Hawthor, she comes in second. And there's a lot more to that, but, but I won't dig too, too deep into the significance of left and right and the male and the female and who's coming from what angle. But her first words to him are conscious theatrics are unparalleled. And I couldn't help myself because it's her first words. I just uh, had to pay a little extra attention to her first words. And I found some just fun little 
uh, potential anagrams and rearrangements of those letters. Uh, I'll just Kanshu. say too, theatrics is is a play. Yes. And a play is something, play is something you do on a court. Right. Yep. You're yep. playing ball. They're ballers. You got it. Just yep. like the priests of, of ball or any other of these uh, priest sorcerers from the past, they also ran the theaters. The priests yep. were the actors in the theaters. Yep. So I bet I messed around with uh, some of the letters in here, you know, Conchus, the eat Rick's are unparalleled. Well, you get, you take the R I C S a, you get a Sakri, uh, reune parallel. And then the, uh, I just left the D E and the T H in red, the very interesting potentials in that phrase. But what really stood out down here is his response to her was a question. He uh, did not answer. When, I think she asked, you must be his uh, uh, Kanchu's avatar was the next question. And he didn't say yes or no. He answered her with a question, which is highly Masonic. Uh, that's the kind of thing you would expect from a lawyer answering a question. That's what you do in question. court. Yeah. Yep. And so his response is, hi, and who are you? And those letters, H-A-W-A-Y, you flip them and you all, and it's pretty close. It's close enough for me. He is stating Yahweh. Oh, close enough for you is, uh, you know, within, within 300 miles. Yep. <laughs> so he's basically. I'm, not, I'm just joking, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he's basically, she says, you must be Kanchu's avatar. And he's actually correcting her. He's saying Yahweh because he is Jewish. He is the av avatar of Yahweh. So his question is actually identifying a deeper level of his identity uh, when he says, hi, and who are you? It's definitely a Yahweh encode there. thought that was pretty worthwhile. As Hebrew reads in the, in, uh, from right to left, as opposed to right to left, or left to right. So uh, kind of a fun one. And then uh, the next one, it really reveals who she is. Uh, in a very profound way to me, this was this was like alarming. You know, people are want to make these things uh, uh, appropriate, uh, and you know, maybe inspire people to be like, "Yeah, bring back Hawthor. Hawthor's cool. She was sexy in the movie. Why would I think she's Why would I think she's diabolical or evil?" Well, when you apply the cultural norms. Uh, the cultural undertones to what they're saying in the film, a lot of very uh, nefarious uh, potentialities come forward. So she says to him, she says it was not long ago that Kanchu enjoyed Hathor's melodies. There is so much more behind those words that a lot of people nowadays that haven't done their study and that don't know their history, that don't know the cultural uh, complexities of what Hathor really means, they're going to think that's very charming. They're going to think, oh, isn't that romantic? The gods are expressing affection for each other. They used to have relations. Well, the nature of those relations, the true depth and nature of those relations are nothing that anybody today wants anything to do with. So it's not pussyfooting around, cutesy wootsy, tiptoeing through the tulips bullshit. This is some nefarious shit. The real you, you've heard of gooses and, and Zeus, right? You've you've heard what happens with this, right? Like it's I like the way SB Alger puts it. All right, all the time, Zeus. Right, right. Well, I'm some. I'm correlating Hathor with with Zeus. Right, because he, uh, just, yeah, he definitely. But in a different he, age, in an yeah, earlier uses, age, just like, okay, so following the age of Taurus, when Hathor and the Apis bull and things like that were the symbols of the sun, before or following that is the age of Aries. The age of Aries is when, all of a sudden, you get the rise of a of a god like Zeus, who wears the ram's horns. The ram's mm -hmm. horns are, but his title. Zeus Amon or Jupiter Amon. Amon is referring to the ram or the lamb, the age of Aries. So 
It's the same guy. It's the sun. It's the daemon of many names. There's one being, one Vulcan, one Pata, one grand architect that the um, the daemon of many names. And then it just is this one character changing costumes throughout the different ages and in different places. That's how I see it. Uh, in the esoteric, the priests give you a confusing jumble of all these different gods and goddesses and seemingly varied traditions from place to place, even from city to city within the same nation like Egypt. And I don't think that necessarily the nefarious aspect of the priest class was maybe it wasn't as nefarious everywhere at all times, but at certain, at some point, <laughs> at some point, at the very least at the point of the current Roman empire and the Vatican takeover, that's when this went from being teaching tools for the, for the people and a path towards a higher level of consciousness possibly. And uh, you know, it's teaching and guidance for people that wanted to overcome their slavery to ego into a system to actually create schism and fracture an MK ultra people. The very same information that was for healing the divide between the conscious self and the ego and the unconscious, uh, that very same system can be inverted to MK ultra people, schism them, create alters and mind yep. control them. Yep. Cir cir circum MK size, circ MK size, circ MK size, circumcise. It's all yeah, there. So Hathor and Zeus are the same being. Uh, right. Zeus is eternally a maid and a man. Right. Yeah. So Hathor was the Egypt. Well, yeah. Yeah. So she is definitely blood magic. She is rep repping blood magic and sacrificial magic and uh, publicly displaying uh, blood ritual so that the other people stay in line. That is essentially the uh, entire gist of her of her spell, you could say. And uh, it was a couple weeks ago, I found her on the $100 bill hidden in there with Benjamin Franklin in the, uh, in this ink well, in the ink well, there is the, the uh, Liberty Bell and it's cracked in half. So I took the Liberty Bell, I split it in half and I image reversed right to left in the, uh, sure enough, there's Hathor, the, the image of the bull is on the bill uh, on the bell of the $100 bill with Ben Franklin here. And that was an old weave we've already kind of went over, but also Hawthor's ears. Uh, uh, Mario has kind of confirmed with me that the ear shape is in fact part of the bris ritual, that that is the pulling forward of the foreskin in preparation for a cut uh, for a blood sacrifice. And all of these things uh, are ink red a bowl that they're encoded so deeply uh, on in, in right out in the open. And a lot of people uh, uh, just don't see it. You know, they keep on rolling with the punches. Uh, so uh, also another thing that I discovered is that the word Taurus has a gematrological value of 100 exactly in the most simple of ciphers. So it's very interesting that Taurus uh, locks into the hundred dollar bill with Benjamin Franklin here. Uh, but that's kind of an old weave. Uh, and up there in the corner, that's- Fuck uh, you, Benjamin Franklin! Thank you, thank you. Hail, hail. <laughs> so in the upper corner- I hope corner, you heard that, Jim. A, yeah, man. That's a uh, circumcision castration implement, that little silver shape up there, which is a very funky little device. I actually need to ask Mario again what that's called so people can look it up. Um, so yeah, I'm seeing a lot of Belfagor all throughout. And then this is what she's talking about when she says she's the uh, uh, goddess of music and love. By the way, that's a G-O-M-A-L, a gommel. That's a three. That's a gimel. Uh, I've been saying this a lot, but love is yov, y'all. Mm, Zeus again. There, yeah. There's a, also a reason why uh, this is a huge tangent to get into, but I'll just say <laughs> there's a reason Sex magic is a thing for a reason. Sexual energy is misharnessed for, by and, and, and wielded. Um, people are manipulated to give up their sexual energy, to have their sexual energy corrupted. All of that, you know, there's yeah. a wrong kind of love. That and it's up. in service to the um, this demiurge archetype that the secret societies think that they're serving or trying to 
jailbreak themselves out of one way or the other. It's all mm-hmm. this kind of corrupted Gnostic thing going on. But love, L-O-V-E, the letter L, I've been saying this a lot lately because it's so mind-blowing. Whenever you look at the capital letter I and the letter L, <laughs> the lowercase letter L, it looks the same, mm-hmm. uh, depending on how you write the I, of course. So an I in the Roman version, uh, Yov would actually be written J-O-V-E or I-O-V-E and pronounced Yov either way. Yov, Yova. Uh, there's so many different versions of that, but I just want to point that out that when they say God is love, they're telling you God, their God is Jove. Their God yes. is Zeus. Their God is Hathor. Their God is the sun, actually. Can you make that a little bigger? So this is this is the sacrificial bull of Hathor, which is mythological. Uh, you know, there are people out there who want to debunk this, but um, so his response to her saying that Kanchu uh, used to enjoy my melodies, which, by the way, the word melodies ends in the word dies, <laughs> mal uh, dies, bad deaths, uh, and has a gematrological value of. Uh, well, and Mel is myrrh. Yeah, okay, nice. Uh, melody myrrh is Odis, <laughs> the yeah. uh, the waters yeah. of creation of Dis. Dis is another word for Deuce. Dis. It's the the dual god. Uh huh. So do Janus, know that same that, guy. That is a that's an actual torture device, right? Bull. And yes. yes the There's... Jove is called Jupiter is called Jove now. The planet luminary that we call Jupiter, but you Potter is in the esoteric. It's all the sun and the exoteric. They put all these names on different bodies and they're like, Oh, they're different characters. But, what, um, so, Yov is and Jupiter, you Potter, <laughs> the, the high father, all that is, it's all the sun. Uh, well, please I, I, I got to disagree. Chance. I books. think there's real alchemy involved here. Like a brazen well, alchemy book. is not the same as astro theology though, for the right, record. But- but the, the alchemy is crucial. Like there's a lot of ingredients here. Like tin and copper are what make a brazen bowl. And it, and it uh, would land not on the sun. It would land on Venus because copper is the element of Venus. So I just got to point out that it doesn't all go straight to the sun. I think this one lands on Venus pretty solidly because it's a brazen bowl. It's brass. It's made out of brass. 90% copper, 10% aluminum is brass. Well, so think it, about a brazen. The brazen bull is the apis bull. Uh-huh. A- apis is philologically the same as opis or ophis. Uh-huh. We're right there in the same ballpark. The right, brazen right. bull is the brazen serpent. Uh, true, true. Yes. Uh, which, if you follow the path of Venus, like a serpent, it'll make that five-pointed star over the course of seven years. And I think those are some of the secrets that are that are also valuable, aside from everything going to the sun. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason that I always bring it back to the sun is to just show that in different mythologies and different and everything, there's a syncretism to it that mm-hmm. is astro-theological yeah. and that we don't need to fight about like which tradition is right or yeah. if there are if there's literally some god out there that you can contact or like mm-hmm. work for <laughs> named Jupiter or Venus or Mars or whatever. Yeah. You know, well, the, the, I, I, I'm just trying to undo the idolatry aspect basically. True. Yeah. True. Uh, and I think what, what I really love is the alchemy aspect is like the elements. I, I believe that the alchemical or the periodic table is, is being deified. In a, in a really interesting way. And there's there's a lot to that. Um, and I think that they, ideally, they would encompass both the calendar and the cycles of the sun, also the primordial process of going from the how it came to be from the beginning to now, and they would not miss any of the elements on the periodic table. So there, that's those are kind of the three ciphers that I'm always holding in my mind. Uh, astro theology, cosmic arrangement, alchemy, and the calendar. So, uh, yeah, that's what she was really getting at when she says he used to love my music. Uh, that bowl, when the human boils inside of it, the bowl uh, bellows. 
and covers up the sound of the person screaming inside and makes uh, music. Speaking of music and the, and the Ennead, how many muses? How many muses are there? Should should be nine. Nine muses. What do you know? <laughs> and and that's even think of this. It's sick muse. That's a sick muse that would consider the sound of boiling humans to be music. It's kind of sick. <laughs> oh, Gordy, you're muted. <laughs> I'm yelling at the dogs. Sorry, <laughs> they're they're crowding me. I'm like, back up! Yeah. I keep the door shut, but it comes at a heavy cost yeah. because as the time progresses on the clock, and I'm under these hot lights, and there's no airflow, oh, and my computer yeah. gets hotter, it starts to just really. I'm I'm starting to bake in here after two hours in. <laughs> you're in the you're in the brazen. Bowl like, right now. I think that I'm lo- like getting oxygen cut off to my brain when podcasts go longer than two hours and I have my door shut. I'm like I've used up all the air in here and now I'm running on fumes. Anyway, should we move forward in the plot here? Yeah, let's yep. do. Let's okay, do so the next thing I don't have any screenshots from it, but the next thing that happens is he goes on. Uh, Mark goes on a search for an antiq or uh, you know underground antiquities dealer who can help him find. The sarcophagus of Senfu. And I was like, who the fuck is Senfu? What are they talking about? Because somehow this sarcophagus of Senfu is going to reveal to him some kind of map or key to find the tomb of Amit so he can prove and stop that, prove that Harrow is trying to resurrect Amit and stop him from doing so. And um, I was like, okay, let's look at the consonants here. S N F. Ah, where did we just come from? The Great Pyramid of Giza. Who is claimed to have built the Great Pyramid of Giza? Sneferu. <laughs> so Senfu, I'm pretty sure, is just them saying Sneferu. That's what hell of a snafu. <laughs> <laughs> Senfu, Sneferu, Snafu. Yeah, and, uh, you know, even that is silly to me because they say that this guy was ruling for 24 years by most consensus Egyptology. And that somehow he like, yeah, I'm this. I just happen to know how to build these giant fucking things, and no one did it before, and no one can do it again. But I, don't worry, Snefru's got this. And by the way, I, then I was like, okay, is there a sarcophagi for Snefru? Since we're looking for Senfu's sarcophagus, and turns out no, they've never found a tomb or sarcophagus for Snefru. Oh, interesting, because she tells him he's got a. It was sold on the black market. Right, so, in, so we're going to private. go deal with the guy who's trading in black market relics, and I'm pretty sure that we know, Smithsonian Institution, that most of the mm-hmm. important artifacts of history, in particular the history of the giants, who were probably the guys who built the giant ass pyramids, are in private collections of wealthy gangsters. We know that for sure. So they're kind of letting you know that, and then okay, so they come to this guy's. Private collection. There's a couple of like little foo foo um, scenes between their melodrama of husband and wife bullshit that I don't care about. We'll just move forward. And uh, then they get to this guy. His name is um, Bogart, I think, is the character's Mo- name. Mo- but- Mogart. Mogart. Yeah. Mogart. Yeah, Mogart. That's right. It. That's him. And so we have a sacrifice ritual involved with this guy because. Let me double check when he died. Um, Gaspard Ullier is his name. Ullier. Gaspard Ullier. And he was killed in January 19 of this year, right before the show came out. Probably got the, he probably got the, uh, speared, the prescription spear that everybody's so enthusiastic about. I don't know. He's, they say he died in a skiing accident, but skiing accident has the same gematria value as his name. So I don't know. Whoa, nice find. So this nice. guy is supposed oh, to be- and it was on 119 that he died. Of course, there's a 911 for you too. Hey. He's in the comic, he's supposed to be uh Midnight Man. 
the Mogart becomes the midnight man, is, which is essentially his polar opposite. He's the dark uh, version of, of Moon Knight. And yeah, and skipping you... ahead at the end of this scene, when Kanshu goes tick tock, Mark, tick tock, he's standing on a clock that is on midnight. That's a little, that was what I noticed as a little hint to Midnight Man. Oh, and nice. There's, there's two X's on that pole. That's wow. Hecate. That's two X's, the two crosses. Nice. I didn't even see the two X's. Holy shit. Kind of jumped so the, us ahead. There's a lot between this and where we were at, but still. In the, going back shit. to the, the, uh, scene at the with the horses so that that little arena he's got in his apparently this is his backyard this guy has like the ancient um artifacts inside those pyramids and around you see around the um the thing the little horse track i can't remember what the game is called it's a arab or arab egyptian uh, it's like a, it's a game, but it's more like a dressage almost with uh, horses. So it's like, it's this, it used to be a yearly tradition or something like this, but they do it for tourists now, but they kind of do a uh, game with uh, spears. And this is what they're, they're doing. And he says it really fast. And I can't remember what the name of the, the game is at any rate each one of those little pillars that are around the um the arena there are mirrored and when you saw that that first image that you're showing uh, before this when they're walking into the there it is there are that's them in the mirror that is not that's not their actual you know oh, that's them reflected yeah. yeah that's why i grabbed that screenshot nice catch yeah they're in the mirror that's that's not that's that's the reflection so it I find it really interesting, you know, in um, Western horse racing, we use the mirror also to freeze time. You know, they use it at the end of, a, of the uh, horse racing to find out who was ahead, right? It freezes, um, they use a mirror and the photograph that's in alignment so that they will know who's ahead, right? So if it's actually freezing time. In this case, I I think there this is a, a time thing as well, but this is this is a portal thing, um, and it's the mirrors are I think strategically placed, kind of bringing them into a different space because it's it mm -hmm. this whole feels like it's supposed to be his backyard, but you can tell it's a set like really you can tell, you know it's this is indoors somewhere. Yes. Um, but the, the mirrors, I believe, are, are taking them into, the, into a liminal space. Right. Know, they, that's the thing that I've been digging on. I found this guy, Kasara, this a R Russian astrophysicist named Kasarev, Nikolai Kasarev. And um, he did all these stu studies in Russia on mirrors and using kind of the uh, psychomantium idea. Yeah. Um, where he would have uh, remote viewers in a uh, a psychomantium, but it was of mirrors, you know, but it was a spiral of mirrors. And apparently this guy had wicked, his, his remote viewers were like essentially time travelers. They could actually go to a space and interact in that space. So, I really think they're they're encoding um, portals essentially with all these mirrors and the talking to each other and it's that traversing of the the spaces, you mm -hmm. know, um, and it's all over in every single scene. Like they can't. It's part of the device of the show itself. It's is the spell of them talking to mirrors. We have we have characters that can't interact in flesh but they interact in the mirrors right showing that that's that's the portal to the other side that's inside us like that guy so mark is talking to himself inside the mirror uh steven is talking to himself inside the mirror and all of a sudden and then we find out there's another one in there too but um right. i think all these uh 
these are spaces and time, like finding out, like I think the mirror is taking us out of the dimension of time. So this, this is this guy's idea is that time actually is a fuel and the time itself is actually fueling stars. Um, this dude was actually. Um, Sounds like arrested. most things that priests and scientists say. Just like totally unverifiable, wild speculation. <laughs> <laughs> it may it may have a lot more merit. I think. I like that. That's cool. Uh, time is fuel. Yeah. The, yeah. Isn't that interesting? So his idea was that you could, you know, when as you're seeing light from a star, you're you're actually seeing you know light in the past because it's right. so far away. This is what astrophysics tells us, right? So he, he, now his idea was novel in that he would take the uh, telescope and put it where a star will be. And he could demonstrate that the observer actually changes the trajectory of the star. So you could actually kind of set it off and the ob observation is actually what changes the telemetry of the star. Whoa. So... In this, because of that, he set up this idea that you the the whole body is based on now he said spirals, which essentially I guess is kind of like torsions, but you know, kind of like that that uh, Tower of Babel that we're going to yeah. create in Minnesota. It's all twisted, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, um, yeah, this this has sent me down some different roads and I think that uh, I think they're showing us how they're making portals and that that's the thing with the uh, you know everybody keeps saying CERN is is uh, doing portals they've been doing it everywhere they oh, yeah. do it all the time we make portals everywhere you could do it at home you could do it yourself yeah you know just make sure you close it when you're done yeah 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 close the door all right you know you'll let it lets gin in, all right? Yeah. You know, that brings a thought to my mind just randomly. I've heard in metaphysical thought that our pupils are black holes. And mm. wouldn't it be interesting if the power of everybody's black holes was being captured by the screen? That's just an interesting thought. There's a lot more to that, but I'll just put float that out there while we're on the subject. Yeah, there's a that is a, oh man, black hole and a black hole put together. What do you get? What a sun? I I don't think you get a sun. I think you, <laughs> I feel like that's like a female female relationship. Can't really Scissors? procreate. <laughs> 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 uh parthogenesis that's it parthogenesis so uh, gordy that that scene that that image that you caught with them standing in the mirror so the high priestess card represents the water reflecting the moon and what the the next line right here that is about to be spoken he he says so what this guy is like uh spends his whole life getting uh practicing so this ritual uh and she says no 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 he has the best in the world who train him in this ritual in his backyard so she reflects his words he's the moon she's the water and she reflects his words back to him but she corrects the image she gives an even clearer image than what he says and she ends with in his backyard, which is very interesting because we have a bunch of dudes on horses playing with their phallic symbols with rainbow lighting all throughout. So getting trained in his backyard by the greatest definitely has some, uh, we'll just say some rainbow color added to the implications of what they're getting at. I think that's a it's homoerotic. It's homoerotic. The whole film is like steeped in homoeroticism. It's just uh, frustrating. Yeah, he definitely gets speared by these guys. 
right? Because it has to be Keyword. implied. Yeah, it's always implied. It's never it's never forthcoming. It's always uh, in the subtext. It has to be subtle, uh, which is whatever. It is what it is. So, yeah, it is what it is. Here's the uh, pyramids where these artifacts are kept. They look just like the Louvre in... Oh, good catch. I noticed that. So maybe they're insinuating that maybe gangsters own that too. I don't nice. know. Nice. Or that the relics in the Louvre are acquired by ill-gotten means as well. Yeah. So Mark needs to go check this out. Um, Layla tries to keep these guys from getting too suspicious, but they're very suspicious, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. This is the close-up of what the nice catch tomb of Snefu, <laughs> which Sneferu has, looks like. It has breasts. That's what I was thinking, man. I'm, this is really hermaphroditic mm -hmm. here. And I don't know what they're trying to tell us with this. Uh, I looked at this for a little bit, and nothing jumped out at me too much. Mm -hmm. and it looks like there's a dog. Don't know who this is. It's probably coming through a little darker in the stream yard. It is what it is. But while he's, um, just to get back to the Hathor of it all, while he's looking at this, oh, I'm going to skip this part. I was, I got into, <laughs> got into a side tangent looking into the red pyramid uh -huh. that was said to be Sneferu's tomb potentially, but that's not important for now. But he's talking to Stephen in the mirror because Stephen could figure out what the puzzle is about this sarcophagus. Where's the map? How does it work? But Stephen wants control of the body and Mark's like, do you want a bloodbath? You need to help me. So bloodbath. Right. He says that very clearly. And in the moment he says that is the first time they show the masks, the ceremonial masks. As he turns to her and says, do you want a bloodbath? They flash the masks that are stuck, that are that are skewered on, on spears. The masks are actually uh, impaled on the spears. And in just a second, when the bloodbath happens... Uh, there we go. There's the spears there we go. with the masks. They're impaled on the spears. And in that, uh, in that moment, a whole lot of things tie in to the bloodbath, the uh, impaled spears... And the fact that he's about to ceremoniously be impaled by spears. Uh, and that there's a big weave going on there. Let's see. And it happens to him while he's wearing his mask. Yes. Yeah. When he dones the mask, the bloodbath begins. That's so true. Uh, so then he has to like switch personality or coax his other personality, the smart side of himself. He has to bring forth uh, that Stephen, right? He has to try to negotiate with Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> an interested third party was the line. Oh, man. Very. Or a oh, concerned. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. The, the concerned third party shows up uh, in the form of Harrow showing up. He's the concerned third party. That was the line. Right. The but, tertium quid. The tertium quid. Nice. So, so while he's trying to convince Stephen, he has to look in the reflection of the of the pyramid, and uh, and he's trying to coax him out. And Stephen's like, "Nah, bro, sorry, it's coded. You need you, you're not smart enough. You can't you can't see the signs and symbols that are in front of your own face." And uh, Chance, can you pull up that next one I sent to you? Because as soon as I hear the word "it's coded," you better believe I'm. Uh, I'm getting out the camera. I'm snapping pictures and doing the gematria. So the scene where he says it's coded, he's standing in this shape. This is vortex math. He's saying it's a code while he's standing inside the symbol of vortex math right here, which is uh, integral to the Enneagram. And this is a quick, uh, just one of many, uh, things you can do with the Enneagram. And when you take that system and you expand it out uh, to the next level, you get a Star of David. That is the next level of penetration of the Enneagram uh, Vortex Math Code. And this is uh, laying it all out uh, for everybody to screenshot and ponder. 
But I just went ahead, and while we're talking about codes, I got I pulled up the gamatria for the title of this episode, the friendly type. And you'll notice there's a 93 in the friendly, the word friendly. Uh, that is Thelemic, that is Rosicrucian, that is basically all secret societies. They got a big hard on for the 93. Um, and there wasn't much else in this uh, other than they're all three sixes and nines when you look at it. The 33, friendly, 93, type, 66. So you've got all the threes, the sixes, and the nines uh, in the title of the friendly type. And then I did a quick little decode on up here with the 15 letters and three words was uh, comes out to 153. And that is the 17th triangular number, which is encoded in the parable of Christ uh, predicting how many fish are in the net. It was 153 fish. And that number is the 17th. Uh, I think it's the 17th triangular number. It's either that or the 17th prime. I hope I got that right. I might have to double check my own work, but yeah, that was kind of a fun little code. As soon as I hear the word code, I'm like, uh-huh. What else is there? What's underneath? Okay. So uh, they end up getting into a fight. Once Harrow shows up, uh, they get caught basically guns get pulled on them. Mark has to summon the suit. And then here he is standing at the top of the pyramid and it is midnight. And like Joshua pointed out in the chat, the midnight is the hour of judgment when the angel of death of the Lord passes over Egypt and starts killing fools. And that's what happens here. He kills so many people. It's like, you know, it's been a slow, a slippery slope for superheroes and superhero movies from the age where the violence was cartoony and non-lethal mm -hmm. to Gwen Stacy gets killed in Spider-Man and the silver age of comics begins. And then here we are all the way now where we're celebrating this so-called superhero who is the a major murderer. Like he kills a ton of people. He came onto their turf to take right. their shit yeah. and they're defending themselves and he kills them like all, he kills like all of them. Uh, yeah. Is anyone it, thinking twice about this? Like, is, are we sure this is a superhero? Cause uh, he invaded their property and killed them and took their shit. I'm just pointing that out. Right. <laughs> and he killed she, a lot of people. I don't even yeah. know. I lost count. I wonder what the body count is for Mark Spector moon Knight in this show. Right. People and do she, that. People watch shows and they count up the kills and, I could probably find it on Google right now. And she even uh, she even picks up the gun and she blasts dudes who are running away. She shoots guys in their back as they're trying to get away. She's capping Scorpio. Them. Yep. She puts two She's in Scorpio. one guy. Boom, boom. And she puts one in the other guy. That's a two and a one. Joaquin Boaz, high priestess status. And then they get into the into the into the fight and. Uh, he ends up killing uh, uh, the host, the uh, G Gaspar. She, oh, check he, this he out. Okay. As he's running away. I just looked it up. I just Googled it. So Mark or Moon Knight or between his personas, he has 74 kills in the show. All right. And Harrow, the bad guy, he killed 17 people in the show that you see. So, like, who's the bad guy here? I mean, I know that it's wow. implied that Harrow's going to kill millions of people, but... Did you damn. say 74? Yeah, 74, according to this quick Google search. And that's uh, total in the whole series? Yeah. Okay. So that's a GD. That's the name of the ineffable. Oh, yeah. G-D. It's also Tungsten, Wolf Oh, well, get this. The other, Khonshu apparently has 26 kills in the show. Which is the, a, a number for God too? That's uh, iron, in the number uh, that's our alphabet. Twenty six. Yeah, iron is a weapon, but twenty six is the gematriological value of God. Oh snap! Nice, excellent, excellent. Uh, so wow, he's killed a lot of people. Uh, he get he you know he gets skewered by these men's phalluses, but yeah, doesn't okay. stop him. 
So this part is, this is really weird. And this is what happens when I watch this movie too many times. <laughs> <laughs> Have we this got is, to that point? Yeah, we're, we've definitely gotten to the, to the extreme uh, with these connections. So uh, if you can sit, if you can put up that, that image I sent you there, Chance, the most recent one, this is so weird. He's getting he's getting skewered. He's it's the bloodbath that was uh, predicted when they showed the masks on the spears. Look how much he looks like a moth. Isn't that interesting? He looks wow. just like a moth. And now this is really obscure. This is really weird. This is way far out. So bear with me. But in the beginning, when she is getting her passport, in the moment when she says, uh, I only steal things that are already stolen and I maybe take a little bit for myself off the top, in that moment, behind her on the wall are two framed panels with collections of butterflies. And for one, you get the monarch programming. But hold on, it gets really fucking weird, y'all. It turns out there is a very obscure cipher that the Nazis were using during the war. They were shipping uh, pinned butterflies in, a, in frames, just like what's on the wall there. They were shipping them from Argentina and South America to Germany. And the Allied forces were actually capturing these, uh, these butterfly collections they were capturing them and trying to decipher them because they knew that there was some code in these butterfly collections, but they couldn't break the code. They never broke it. It's still a mystery today. So they had to let the these, these uh, goods, these uh, artifacts continue to circulate. And they were monitoring the circulation, but they could not crack the code of what these butterflies meant. And so that is just a really interesting tidbit of history as she is a collector of artifacts, we are clearly dealing with encoded information. And Moon Knight is very subtly encoding Mothman. And that just blows hmm. my own mind. I, I don't even know where to go with it. But the fact that he's getting stabbed with spears, he looks like a moth or a butterfly. And she... Uh, or And... She Talking and he about. just killed a dog man. He just he, ritually sacrificed a dog, dog man on a, on a, uh, a Masonic uh, tracing board. Yes, 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 man. That is so weird. So what I'm, this is all so weird, but it God, is. This thing is so fucking weird, man. So to me. Every time I watch this, I'm like, what the hell? Yes. So in my crazy mind. Uh, it all is honing in on my center of my territories map where the fool card falls in Kentucky, where man moth right. caves and many ma mothman uh, stories uh, hail from. There is a connection to the, from mothman to Kentucky and the dog man sightings are all in Kentucky. So I just had to point that out that we've got a lot of initiation and code uh, hailing back to the fool card in the Kayenduaki, Man Moth Cave, Mothman, and the Dog Man prophecies. Isn't, the, isn't Minnesota where the Dog Man is from? The the Beast of Bray Road Dog Man? Isn't that Minnesota? Maybe that's an, another one. I think the primary one is in. Uh, oh, Eastern Kentucky, right? Like it. Southeastern. Yep, Southeastern Kentucky. Uh, forget the name of that those woods, that area, but. It's in yeah. the mountains, in the hills there. Well, yeah, the that's... moth comes out at night, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's obvious regeneration, resurrection symbolism. And in the Native American cultures, they considered it as such. So there's that. <clears throat> they, they also have like a broken flight pattern. Have you guys ever noticed that moths are not graceful? They seem to be like, spasmatically <laughs> flitting around and they just crash into things. They don't land like butterflies. They just an interesting thought because he's constantly hitting his head, right? 
oh. our main character. Uh, so yeah, I'm sending you one more chance. This is a uh, this is really crazy. So the back of the head, the cough, uh, the hitting the head all the time, uh, and this kind of came up with Mario recently. There's two letters in Hebrew. There's Q U O P H or Q O P H, and there's K, K A P H. They sound so very similar, uh, but they have uh, they meet in a very interesting location in the uh, in the American medical experience. Turn your head and cough is strangely uh, ceremoniously preserving. The uh, these two symbols, one which means the back of the head, which is behind last, final, and the least that's kof, and then there's kaf, k a p h, which means a palm of the hand, a wing to allow to cover to open the hand, the power to suppress or lift up. And this is freaking. Nuts, because he is the fist of Conchu, F-O-K. You reverse F-O-K, you get a K-O-F. And when you tell somebody to fuck off, you're telling them to lift up, uh, to leave behind, to go away, to turn their head, and desist, desist, desist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other thing, the Q-O-P-H, the cough, another meaning of it in Hebrew is an ape. Hey, uh, you guys. And then towards the oaf, the oaf to the serpent. Check this out. I didn't even think about to to check out the, that actor's IMDb page. Please pull it up if you can, Chance. Gaspar. Gaspar. Sure. His name I want to just is read this Gaspar quote Uleo. from uh, yeah. an author named Kalmet, who says the inhabitants of Asia, or I'm sorry, Goa, the southwest coast of India did not dare to kill apes any more than serpents because they believed them to be the residences of spirits created by God to afflict mankind in punishment for their sins. Remember, Kof, Q-O-P-H, or K-O-P-H can mean ape in Hebrew. And it has O-P-H, the oaf in Ophis, which means serpent, the Greek word for serpent. So the inhabitants of spirits or inhabited by spirits sent by God to afflict mankind and punishment for their sins. That sounds exactly like what Moon Knight is. He's if infested by a spirit to punish sinners. Just throwing that out there. Nice. I love that. Fist of Conchu is fuck off, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is a great chance. Like these things are just, isn't it just blowing you guys away? The, the, the connections that are happening, like check this shit out. I'm looking at this guy who has been clearly, I don't, I shouldn't say clearly sacrificed. Um, you know, somewhere. I think we can say if it was a, on, if his date of death is encoding 9 11, and the, act, the, the words accident. of the phrase of what happened to him matches the gematria of his name, I think we maybe, maybe he's been sacrificed. I don't know. Best Check this shit out. His filmography includes, of course, Moon Knight. Coma, Sybil, Twice Upon a Time, End of the World, a bunch of other stuff. Okay, wait, wait, wait. There's a, some interesting one. He played Saint. La he played Yves Saint Laurent in in the Saint Laurent mi uh, movie. So, but check this out. You go on down here a little bit. There's a bunch of French movies, right? There's this movie in 2001 called Brotherhood of the Wolf, and it's a French movie about werewolves. I dig this movie. Um, he... Belfagor, Phantom of the Louvre. Yes, thank you. That's what exactly the, the one I wanted to show you. Fuck? He's got That's pyramids that look like the Louvre, you. and we've got <laughs> and the Hathor and the Belf. Oh my exactly. God. What the That's fuck? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> hold on hold on can you can you zoom in shut the front door shut the front door okay I Belfagor, phantom I of the louvre <laughs> is that crazy dude dude uh, 
What come the on, fuck, guys? Come on. What the two, fuck? Three. And it's in 2001. That's a, a Boaz and a Joachim right there. And the scenes that he were was in were apparently deleted, whatever that means. Oh, my gosh. Dudes. Dudes. What in the monk? Fucking truck and the truck, truck, fucking truck. We're There's gonna have to find movies. out about what this movie is. The yeah. Phantom Belphegor awakens at the Louvre, Louvre Museum in Paris, causing electrical havoc. Night guards at the it's museum at start the museum. dying. Lisa gets possessed, and Martin tries to help her. Holy fuck! Good Belphegor. fucking score, Gordy. Good lord, man. Dude, wow. this shit just falls out of the sky for us, man. I don't, you know, the, this is this is what I think, you know, this is Kazarov talking about how we kind of demonstrating how we're changing the reality as we're observing it. I almost feel like that. Like we start talking about this shit and it shows up. Either that or Gabriel's really onto some shit with his Belphegor. Yeah. yeah. Both or both, I'm both. holding back. All of I'm, it. Both is true. Both of those things are true. I'm totally holding back. I see it. I see it everywhere. And I don't want to, I don't want to make myself look crazy by revealing how it yeah. is proliferated. It's it completely saturates uh so many things we do and say and act upon. Damn. Thank you, Gordy. Yeah, this I think we can stop crazy, here. Man. We we got it. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Damn, that's a good one, man. Whoa, tripping me out. Dude, there I is wanna... some more to go through, though. Um, do we want to yeah. say anything else about his fight scene? Oh, I mean, this is kind of just an action scene. Uh the the bell dings when uh he kills Gadspard or whatever that guy's name is. He yeah. as he's riding away, he it strikes kills, midnight. It, yep, the bell dings. So we got the bell ding, the classical conditioning, Pavlovian bell ding. You notice the the uh, colored uh, the colored lights change um, when they're when they're on the um, mm. when they're on the horseback. You know, the homoerotic horseback ride without the shirts. It's all colored lights. Uh, when it shows when it shows Conchu on the on the you know on the outside, it's red and yellow. It's a more of a golden that it's a red. It's only red, gold, and yellow. Red and white light. The light just being kind of warm. Yeah, it's warm yeah. as opposed to, as opposed to cold, right? Or colorful. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I dig it. I dig it. Anyway, what what happens after this? Next, they get in the car ride, time? and so okay. In this scene, when Harrow shows up and uh, he's a concerned third party, he says, "Mark, you are afraid that if you tell Layla what happened to her father, she'll see you as you see yourself, unworthy of love." So we just talked about Chiron in Cancer, and the key. We talked about that last night. I mean, the sun's in cancer, and we talked about Chiron last night. My ca my Chiron falls in cancer, personally. So the key, or the Chiron, is a scarab, <laughs> which is cancer, right? Anyway, Chiron in cancer is the wound of feeling unworthy of love. I thought that was interesting, because he specifically says the words unworthy of love, oddly enough. And so what he's referring to, we don't know yet in terms of the order of the plot here, but... Mm -hmm. They get in the car after they murder all of these people and uh, pat themselves on the back, I guess, about it. <laughs> oh, and his jacket was damaged. He had to ditch his jacket. I really liked that jacket, but he got you know too many spear holes in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so they have this conversation where she's like, every time I find out something I didn't know about you, I think that's got to be the last thing. No more secrets between us. But there's still a big secret. Anyway, this is Pisces. He's a Pisces and she's Scorpio. There are not really any more secretive parts of the sky clock in terms of archetypes than those two. I thought that was interesting. Um, and then we can jump forward to 
where they're trying to decipher the map that they ganked from the uh, the guys they just killed. <laughs> and they have to get Steven out to do it because right. Mark can't figure it out. And, and in, in, that, in that moment that he decides to do the switch, he goes and he breaks the rear, the side mirror off the truck. So it's... Oh, yes, right. that's true. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of weird because they're they're giving us mixed messages here. On one hand, they're telling us that the mirror is integral to the switching of personalities or that it helps with that, with that exchange. But on the other hand, we see that Mark and Steven take the reins without a mirror. You know, the, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be oh. very consistent as to how the transition is done. I just realized who Belfagor is. He's my favorite. <laughs> Dude, oh my God. Belfagor is the shitting devil. Right. So, Feces. Sloth. Yeah. Yeah. He's the he's the one that Scorpio so rules that uh, of the body too, the the rectum. The bump. When I was a kid, we'd go to Mexico and they at all the tourist shops, there'd be like the crafts in Nogales and Wymus and stuff that they'd sell to the tourists were always like leather goods and, and velvet paintings of Jesus or Elvis, right? But they had these great pictures of a, a shitting devil that was smoking a cigarette. And he's like, ah. And I always wanted one. Like, is it, they were, I, I don't know if you can Google that uh, chance. I think it's I think I've seen the devil, the velvet devil before. Yeah. I think Jim Maiden might be able to pull that up if he's in the chat. I think Jim Maiden's got has flashed that oh, before. Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the oh, velvet, my, velvet my art is... trying to eat my, my rocks. Eat the stone. <laughs> Get out. Out. Yeah, that velvet art is, uh, is classic. Have you ever seen that chance? Velvet paintings? They're like... There, nice. There he is. Yeah, that's the one. And he's holding his <laughs> he's holding his tail. That's very scorpion esque, right? And it's 180 from Taurus. It's in opposition to Taurus. Freaking awesome. Oh, yeah, that that man, thing is seriously. it's crazy, but that's a whole nother show. Yeah, we could do a whole <laughs> show on that. We've had some amazing tangents this time. I love doing this because <laughs> you never know where it's going to go. It's so crazy. Let's, yeah, Listen. the stuff that we uncovered that n none of us actually realized until we had the conversation. Yeah. That's the most fun part. Patron demon of Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, See? that's what the Noid is. I bet you the Noid is was a uh, a spell of Belphegor. Of Belphegor, nice. <laughs> Nice. I dig it. Okay, uh, so he figures out the map, and what do you know? We get this, uh, back to the Taurus of it all, we get this Venusian five-pointed star out of the equation. And so they use this to realize, oh, hey, the uh, the map is the constellations, and this is pointing us to the wherever this constellation is at on, I guess, the night that, Snefu died. Somehow they're going to know that date. <laughs> it's all very like, you know, TV logic in terms of them figuring this out miraculously. But uh, they realize, oh, well, wherever this constellation is, the stars drift over time. So they're telling us that procession is real. They're mm -hmm. putting procession into the public mind, which I've never seen happen before. The idea of procession in, in this sense. Uh, I mean, maybe it's been referenced in other movies and shows but we got lucas in the chat i'm pretty sure he's skeptical of procession i'm skeptical of it too i'm not skeptical maybe that it does happen it's the why the how and the time spans because when you look at the various this is something i've been researching lately is the all the different versions of the bigger cycles of time be they the neros or the yugas and different cultures versions of that and Nobody can keep their shit straight. <laughs> Nobody knows if it's like, mm. you know, what are these cycles actually numbered at? Mm. And we get the 
72 degrees per or one degree per 72 years figure. But when you like start looking into these cults that give us these type of figures and they say, trust us, we know they tend to have a problem with like, they really want reality to conform to their belief and, and their mathematics and things like that. So, you know, they wanted, they really wanted the year to be 360 days. They really wanted that bad. And they'll even give you stories as to why that it used to be. And here's why it's not now stories that nobody can confirm or deny. But I, this is a me paraphrasing Dylan, but I've heard him say this before that it's almost as if God made everything just a little bit off from the perfect whole numbers just to keep everybody on their toes so that no one could think that they had it all figured out. You know, a year is 365 days, not a 360 degree perfect circle, things like that. So, you know, the 72 years that are, that are given for processional one degree drift is really like 71 and some change if it's even accurate. Right. So mm -hmm. all that being said, I think it's interesting that they're giving us the idea of procession and they're taking us back to a time 2000 years ago in the sky clock. They're literally showing you that the sky is a clock as um, Khonshu and Mr. Knight, I believe that's this version's name, Stevens Moon Knight, mm -hmm. wind back the sky clock to put the constellation they're looking for into the place it would be at the time that it should have that they should be looking for it so that they can get the coordinates that they need. Yeah. Interesting that while she's looking at it through her amazing high-tech iPad that somehow is able to look at these things and then give you coordinates and make you a map and do it all automatically. Uh -huh. um, you see the Orion's belt. You see the Orion here. Orion is Osiris, y'all. Yep, yep. Yeah. They're following the archer, the Toxo pointing the way. And Toxo here, meaning bow. Here we have that high, that nature of the high priestess again. She is reflecting what the moon is doing. The whole time she's like using her computer screen to like take pictures of what he's holding, take pictures of what she, he's doing. She's like the camera person of the whole scene. Well, much like the Mississippi River reflects the light of the moon. She is embodying the high priestess by reflecting his actions uh, in a lot of ways. And Chance, can you... When you get a sec, can you pull up the most recent one that I sent to you? Because they de they totally uh, do a nod to the moon card in this scene. As they come up upon to the top of the hill, uh, he's the white pillar, she's the black pillar. Uh, he's standing and she is kneeling. That is the nature of the two dogs on the moon on the moon card. Uh, one dog is seated, is tame, is domesticated. The other dog is standing up uh, wild and ready, uh, just like she is kneeling and he is standing uh, as they look up at the moon. Uh, I think that was, uh, that's very interesting. And the moon card is number 18. The 18th letter is R, and it has all things mirror has three R's in it. Reflectivity. If you go through the uh, dictionary and read all the R's, you will see it has a lot to do with doubling, reflecting, repeating, and even rewinding. They're about to rewind the clock. Uh, so the fact that they are. Yeah, the R is raw, is ray. Yes. R phonetically, like. A R yep. means river. Nice. Nice. So, yep. She's the river. He's the R. They are. They are and then R is close to or, which is named for the sun. I mean, phonetically, when you get into the philology of it, you yeah. find that so many things are encoding astrotheology through the metaphor of the river of the sun in the sky, which is the ecliptic. Nice. Nice. And here and you have it right here. You see the path that this river takes. That was yep. a good catch there. I saw that too, but I didn't screenshot it. Yes. I it, love the it, way you make these little it, compilation uh, collages, dude. It's very yeah. helpful. I appreciate the work you put into the research Me for too, this, man. man. Hell yeah. Uh, like, my like, pleasure. This wouldn't be the same without you, without either of you. But like, uh, Gabriel, <laughs> you're some kind of special freak. Thank you, Thank you man. I appreciate it. I think I think of the fact that you know a picture says a thousand words, 
And so if I put three or four pictures in here, we got 5,000 words and we could go all night on this shit. <laughs> and we do. Yeah, buddy. So and the, uh, one more point is when they speed up the sky clock, it gen that the effect of it is generating the arcs. It's all the arcs come to light in this scene. So there's the final and probably most important R of them all. Hmm. so uh this gets conchu in trouble the gods are like you shouldn't be messing with this guy like that so they take away his powers they strip his powers and remember the five pointed star we just saw who's the uh you know the the map oh, you know yeah they, they're the authority the legend that they're following is a five-pointed venusian star taurus and uh the gods get together Five of them. Pentagon. That's not an Ennead. This is the Pentagon. The authorities are called in to arrest Conchu. <laughs> the ha authorities. There she is. No gas. And and one thing that I'm thinking about is the fact that he gets turned to stone. And uh, there's probably a weave that maybe we'll bring forward in future works uh, regarding Medusa and Medusa turning people, turning things to stone. Uh, I think there's a, uh, something to say about that component. But yeah, he becomes a graven image, essentially. Yes. And this is not more of the idolatry of uh, this show, promoting the idolatry of this show, in that they're telling you. Basically, without exactly saying it, telling you that the Egyptians believed the gods were in this statue. That it was actually a god in there. And according to Howdy, and I have a lot of trust and faith in what Howdy says, but he says that the gods, again, were not meant to be taken as actual beings. That they represented aspects of nature and of the universe. So whenever you created a statue of a god... It wasn't that the God was in there. It was that the vibrational quality of energy that that God metaphorically represented was represented by the statue. And so the statues could hold power. And he has anecdotal stories about actually helping, about seeing people receive healing from statue, statues that have the qualities of a healing God in the statue or represented by the statue. But he also talks a lot about the way that the statues were made versus the way that antiques are made now. But he claims that at least once that he ritualistically imbued a statue. I think it was of Isis with, with the qual like with Isis, like with her qualities. He, he charged it up is a way of putting it. And that somebody that was uh, having a health problem or in some kind of pain that he knew he had them hold the statue and that they felt better not unlike receiving Reiki or something. So I find that to be important. And then um, while Harrow's the one holding the statue here, he shows up after they trap. You know, he doesn't show up to help them trap because <laughs> then it wouldn't have been a, a five-pointed star. <laughs> but he does show up afterwards. And he says to Khonshu, where he asks, can he hear me? And they're like, I think he can, but we don't know. And they, they mentioned that so many before have been trapped in statues here, that there are numerous gods that have been imprisoned into these statues. Anyway, Harrow says to the statue, had you not broken me so completely, I would, have, I would not have known the value of healing. I enjoyed dealing out pain for you. It is the greatest mm -hmm. sin I carry. He says, I'm carrying a the greatest sin I carry while he's holding a statue of the moon God and an ancient name for the moon God as a masculine God was sin. Nice. So this is like reaffirming the MK ultra aspect of it all, which is that yes, they are, you know, <laughs> they're putting the, the days out there. The hierarchy evacuating you is creating a constant repetitious loop of trauma, 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 so that they're healing is necessary and their version of healing is actually more trauma and continuing the cycle and it's yep. not really wholeness so there's to to even reinforce what you just said even more chance 
uh, it turns out uh, the producers of the show intentionally put the sound of broken glass in every step that Haro takes. So in this scene in particular, as he walks up to the statue, we, the, the unwitting uh, watchers, are being exposed to the sound of his pain with every step on a very subtle level. So if anybody goes and watches this, listen very closely to Haro as he walks. They have uh, uh, instilled the message of the pain that was put in place in that opening scene when he poured his later, later skaters, when he poured them full of glass, uh, all hearkening back to the, uh, the initial trauma, the, uh, the opening scene, the initiation, the birth scene, and that separation, the breaking, which is also the uh, uh, killipoth, the shells, the broken shells of the of the killipoth. But that's a whole nother weave for maybe next time. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think this is taking us to the end. This is where the episode concludes. Nice. Well, gentlemen, that we we just solved it. We figured it out. Stop now. <laughs> is there is there six total? Yeah, there's six uh, so far. I mean, it's supposed to get another season. Oh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, there'll probably be a while before that. So yeah. we got three more of these to go. If we can pull it off and do three in July, maybe, maybe we should try to double up on the next one. Bro, we just went three hours on one episode. <laughs> I know. Do you, do you think we could do? Could do we you think you, Gabriel? Gabriel, Gabriel you, you can't you do, that. do that. We <laughs> you can do that. You can't do that. <laughs> it would be a nice challenge. Be a good <laughs> challenge. <laughs> no, anyway, I don't want to because I really like. I actually really like just the one episode approach. It gives me. It's it it gives me more feels like I have more safety to really hone in and zero in on things. And it gives us more space for tangents. Nice. You know, yeah. otherwise we would run the risk of becoming just sort of a, a fast paced plot summary. And we don't want that. We want to get in. We want to find Belfagor on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I don't think they're going to have a second season now that I'm thinking about it. Um, I bet you anything they're going to do that sons of, uh, what was that series? Uh, with... Oh, they're make dude. It's a video game, The Midnight Suns. Midnight Suns. Thank you. They're making into a video game. It's coming out soon. Oh, Action they are? Okay. RPG. Yeah. Okay, so that that's definitely going to be a movie then, if they're putting the myth out there. Maybe so. Myth. Maybe so. Uh, I think that there will be more Moon Knight. I think he's going to be in the Phase Two Avengers lineup or whatever phase it is, Phase Four or Phase Five. But we'll have a lot to work with after Moon Knight. I'm thinking we should go straight into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Yep. Holy yep, yep, shit. Yep. That's going to be... Oh. Doctor Shortage in the Multiverse of Madness. The mom of it all. Back to the corrupt... The Hathor, the Taurus. Right. Because the these, these were launched like one right after the other. I think it was Moon Knight and then it was just a, a span of a week or so and then Doctor Strange came out. Yeah. All yeah. in the sign, all during Taurus season. All during Hawthor. Now, I think Moon Knight initiated in Aries and finished in Taurus, but I'm also excited for Thor, uh, Love and Thunder. Mm. <laughs> it's like like it's saying Thor, Jove, and Thunder, and Jove nice. or Jupiter is a character in this movie. <laughs> That'll be fun. I'm the the last Thor movie was quite fun. I didn't feel too horribly mk ultra to buy it either it was just like a good a good funny action movie so we may or may not analyze that but definitely multiverse of madness after this and thanks everyone for hanging in for a three-hour stream i see a lot of the same names that we started with and how did we do people <laughs> i how feel cool. like we Thank crushed you it so much yeah all you guys that stick around and keep coming in at week after week and on saturdays and stuff we see a lot of these same people i i just Appreciate you guys so much for doing this. Um, hey, let's plug our stuff because if you're if you can't get sick of uh, hearing Gabriel go 
<laughs> all amaze balls and blow you away. Go back to the first click dissonance stuff and oh. look up his territories and his uh, his um, um, and his original Avengers. series about the Marvel movies connecting them to the tarot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. that thing is fantastic. That's where I you know fell in love with your shit, man. So nice. thanks, Gordon. Speaking, thanks. bringing up Belfagor, like man. Uh, Dude. Yeah, I want now. I want a uh, velvet painting of Belphegor trying to shit out his <laughs> his brains. I, I think it's safe to announce this game. too that Gabriel and I are going to be on David Whitehead's Truth Warrior on Monday night. Congratulations! Hey, man. Talking about the the dark goddess symbolism. So I'm not. Uh, Gabriel's going to just be doing what he does, and I'm going to be trying to like add some good etymology to it. <laughs> That's going to be an awesome project. I'm so stoked for that. And Gordy, you oh. get you're going to get all the credit, brother. You you made it all come together when you told me about the echidna. <laughs> <laughs> it all came together with that fact. Dude, it's, that thing, I'm glad it's getting some mileage because it's been haunting me for been haunting years, all of us. Man. And we yeah, just didn't so, know it. Yeah, and, exactly. You know what? Uh, here's one that just occurred to me thinking about it. M-O-A-B. Mother of all beasts. That's another nickname for Echidna. Moab. Moab. They call wow. it mother of all bombs, but it's the it's the Echidna, mother of all beasts. Oh, now I gotta go look at the Moab Utah map. Yeah. I like Moab though. It's so cool. I love there. Moab. It's beautiful. All right, guys, okay. I want to wrap it up. Um yeah. you want to promote any of your, your channels or places? Yeah, uh, slick dissident in the show on notes. You should see links to people's things, but oh, yeah, go for it. yeah. So, slick dissident on YouTube. I'm down with the weaving spiders. Welcome. Are they weaving spiders webs now? Yeah, and I think we should say that so people know what to Google or uh, yeah. YouTube search weaving spiders webs. Now, we had to change channels because uh, our fearless leaders did not have the keys to that channel. Yeah. And I've just done a couple projects with uh, the one-on-one -on -one podcast that are going to come forward uh, pertaining to uh, the dark goddess, uh, basically uh, Hecate. And then we did another one that's about to come out after that on uh, the serpents and serpent cults. So that's something to keep an eye out for coming Ooh. forward. So, Yep. Nice. Uh, the next Vibrant will be Juan and Thomas from Paranoid American. And of course, Gabriel. Oh man, that's yeah. gonna be a good team up. So, uh, also check out. Um, I think it's on um, Rising from the Ashes. My stuff with uh, Homie yeah. Romy and Rising Rachel. from the Ashes podcast and is what you want to search. Right. Rising you want to from make the, the Ashes podcast, podcast in the search terms. Please, okay, yeah, get the right. I, I we'll find a, a link, but uh, Rising from the bot, Rising from the Ashes podcast. Um, with Homie Romy, Mario, the Symbolic Studies monster, and uh, Rachel. And we've been having great discussions about mirrors on that. Um, also, um, Owl News. I have, so um, one of my babies might have an injury, and I'm trying to figure it out. And uh, so if anybody, Knows anything about the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the uh, second eyelid. If you have bird expertise on the optics of owls, I could, I've got some questions for you. So, but um, yeah, I've still got two babies in the tree and two parents in the tree. Um, but Proud I, Papa. They're doing great. And I still do. So, Follow my Instagram, Gordy underscore TWO underscore, underscore shoes. And I still putting up stuff on there. And um, of course, Weeding Spires, Webs. What else we got going, Dave? Other no, things. That's good enough. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. I mean, we have, we're doing stuff every day, basically. Your yeah. Telegram channel, the Mystic Book Club, is really blown up too. Yeah, the conspiratorium is really, we're going to start doing uh, meditations. So um, check that out. You know, get in the conspiratorium because conspiracy, the origin of conspiracy is breathing together. So I want to re really start back into 
you know, um, doing the meditations and doing the breathing exercises and, you know, making it a, a uh, concerted effort towards, towards the good, you know, and getting, getting used to, uh, you know, trying things like this, you know, in a real tangible way. You guys want to really, you know, get your hands on fondle some, Gordy's balls. I've done it. Fondle my balls, baby. <laughs> because <laughs> you can feel them look at that though this thing's the more you mess with them the the more you can tell too the more like the attraction feel. builds it builds the energy builds the more you mess with them which i'm sure is just another thing of of flowing our chi you know getting our chi hot and being being um you know more in tune with ourselves not just our body because god knows we don't Get in touch with our body, and uh, which we should be doing anyway. Which helps, you know, meditation helps that. But you know, doing intuition exercises like this helps your etheric field. You know, your your chi, your your prana, your whole energy being too. So yeah, buddy. All right. Well, Mary X missed to all, and to all a good night. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I appreciate both of you so much. Much love, guys.